Welcome back to Screen Refresh, a show where we revisit the films, shows, and games of our childhood to try to take another look at what we fell in love with. I'm Nick, and tonight I'm joined by my fellow co-hosts, Dean and Tim. Tin Hut! Hail, emissary of Screen Refresh. Tonight we're going over the summer blockbuster to Arnold's toy hunt called Small Soldiers. In a world where nostalgia rages across the land where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world, three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. Have you guys seen Small Soldiers as kids? Oh, yeah. Probably a VHS or TV or something. I don't think I saw this in the theater. It was a 98 release. But mm-hmm. I don't think I went to the theater. Not that I remember. I was a theater brat, so I definitely, I know I saw it. It was pretty big when it came out, at least in terms of, like, for kids stuff. And then always, too, you know, we lived through the craze of action figures, or at least the final bits of or the final bout of action figure collecting and all that. So seeing a badass toy like that and being advertised in the movie trailers for definitely seemed definitely like something to go and watch. Yeah, we bought it when it came out on like the the big VHS plastic case. Um, and I had some of the figures at the time. And I just remember like my parents not liking this movie. Like, we sat down for family movie night, and they were like, this is a lot more than we were expecting for our kids. <laughs> there, I, I read a fact that was like, this is the first and only uh, movie to be re- released in, like, one of those clamshell VHS cases. Because <laughs> oh, I yeah. guess those kind of signified, like, family Disney kind of movies. Yeah. And they were like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> It's a ruse. It's certainly no like blood gushing from your nose Batman Returns kind of thing cuz I did feel it was uh meant much more for kids than that movie did. Right. But one of the bits of trivia that I wrote down somewhere was this movie was supposed to be meant for kids and um the studio started to get involved realizing, you know, maybe we should or rather the movie was yeah. meant for teenagers right. and the studio got involved and in thinking you know maybe we should kind of tone it down a little bit for the kiddos and uh we can market it to them as well but at this point all the writers and joe dante the director he was like um okay kind of too late but some of the <laughs> some of the scenes you can definitely tell the original direction of it because the first i'd say two-thirds of the movie go in a very different direction than the very last yeah because I was reading an article that originally they were paired up with, I think, Burger King to promote the film. And they had like small soldiers toys as part of like their meals and whatnot. And then because of complaints, they backed and were like, uh, if you want to come exchange your toys, you can. Um, only because of, I guess, the response to this is not really a kid's film per se that people were thinking. Like, I, I don't know. It's still... Kids are too fucking sensitive. Jesus Christ. It's like, if it's not Paw Patrol and Baby Shark, then I don't want it in my McDonald's kid <laughs> toy menu. Like, I, I mean, w- there's more to it than just baby crap like that. Because it got to the point where I hated Disney movies because it was just like, I, I picked up on their... Um, Formula? Yeah. It's like, I don't need a, a musical every time I watch a movie. And then it got to the point where I don't want to see animated movies anymore. Because like, I don't want to sit through a musical, thanks. No, thank you. And then that's when, like, Titan A.E. and some of the other more adult stuff started to kind of head my way. I'm like, oh, there's more to it than that. Because that was the biggest takeaway I had from Titan A.E. There's no musical or, like, musical numbers in it. And growing up with Disney, that's all you're, all you're used to is just, oh, why is Quasimodo sad? Well, hold up. We're going to sing about it for the next minute and a half. I love that's a good Disney. musical. That's Disney. That's Disney. Yeah. So but a lot of other like, cartoons too kind of did that and well, it just I, yeah like it didn't Anastasia rub me the right or way. Other, others yeah 
That was just the the thing to do. No, like yeah, all like the Don Bluth ones. I think did Land Land Before Time didn't right. I don't. No think musical. So. No. No. I don't no. remember if Fival did. It. I remember the main song from Fival. Somewhere out there. Somewhere out there. Yeah. But I don't remember if the rest of it had it. Same thing with the sequel. I haven't seen either. I saw I saw the first one a couple years ago again, but. I don't actually remember anything in it, and I don't remember the sequel except for like a couple of scenes, especially like the the crazy eye. <laughs> Fievel goes west. I saw much more than American Tale. Yeah, the sequel. Yeah, me too. So at some point, maybe we'll do Fievel as far as my pick. So released in July of '98. Uh, Small Soldiers, directed by Joe Dante, known for his Gremlin series, and Looney Tunes Back in Action, which I didn't know he did that. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't know that either. Yeah. Watching it, it was I, I actually liked it quite a bit. It was very campy, and um, at first I was expecting something. I don't know why, but I was expecting something more serious. <laughs> for and Looney then, Tunes Back in Action? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It reminded okay. me of like the Rocky and Bullwinkle movie a little bit, and like stuff that like that that came around around the same time. Yeah, it was okay, but it was a lot better than I expected. But I'm pretty sure it, the reception when it came out didn't do well. Plus, it has our beloved Brendan Fraser. I mean, Joe if Dante. you like, oh, go ahead. No, um, no, go ahead. Continue that thought because you're going. No, I was gonna say like if you like this and you like Gremlins, like Joe Dante is one of my favorites. Um. He did Matinee with John Goodman. It's like one of my favorite movies. Um, He originally, well, not originally, but he did The Howling, which was another werewolf movie from early on. That was kind of the the runner against American Werewolf in London, all of that. So it's he's run the both sides from horror over to more kid-friendly to kid-friendly horror. So he, it's, he covers all his bases there. Inner Space as well. I was gonna say you probably know him from Inner Space. Inner or Space the Burbs. Is, is pretty good. Yeah, the Burbs. He's got he's has a solid track record in late eighties, early nineties. Like and he kind oh, yeah. of dropped off a bit, but as far as like feature films. Um but he seemed like he was kind of like a Spielberg kind of protege or like, you know, Spielberg fostering him along in the directing seat because they seem to be he seems to be an E P on all of all of or lots of Dante's uh, feature films. I always wondered, though, when Spielberg attaches his name to something, how much direct involvement he has with it. It probably I mean, varies. I, feel like I mean, he they might ask him, "Hey, could we put your name on the poster as like executive producer?" And he's just like, "I'm sure he probably reads the script. Does this have potential?" And then yeah, from there, he's like, "Yes or no." And then if he even does anything afterward, it just rides it. Yeah, he, he might just stares ask... at their face for a solid ten seconds and then makes a decision. <laughs> He might have just some input, not maybe not hard decisions, but like, yeah, we ran it by Steven. He gave us some, he gave us some uh, suggestions, kind of deal. And his Amblin was involved, like he gave us resources. That's probably yeah. This was like an unofficial Amblin because it doesn't have the the moniker or the logo, but they own some. I just of this think movie. his suggestions are pretty heavy handed. Even though he's like, you know, maybe you should uh, think about this, but it. You know, in reality, he's like has six trained assassins, like <laughs> laser pointing at them from the trees and shit. Hey, Makes I absolutely love the they idea. Look down. But are we set on this toy thing? <laughs> I think the kids might like it a bit more if maybe we went in a slightly different direction. But Stephen, we've already did like ninety percent of the movie. Are you sure? <laughs> Just looks, gets lit up looks with down lasers. and the red laser appears on his chest. <laughs> Oh, we'll fix it. We'll fix it, Steven. No problem. Steven puts his finger up like he's about to cue. Like, um. <laughs> um. <laughs> so this did modestly well. I mean, probably did not. It? I don't remember the toys from this, but I read a little blurb that just said, like, I think the toys even did better than the movie did. I don't remember them. Box office reported an estimated 40 mil budget and earned 14 million its opening weekend. It would eventually gross over 54 mil- million total, but it didn't hold a candle to Lethal Weapon 4 releasing the same weekend and earning 34 million its opening weekend and earning 140 million total. 
Other July movies of that year include The Mask of Zorro, Something About Mary, Saving Private Ryan, and a little indie movie called Armageddon. You might have heard of it if you didn't close your eyes and fall asleep. My wife's never seen Armageddon, and she loves disaster movies. Also, yeah. July of 1998, Basketball. <gasps> basketball has a connection to this movie. It does. <laughs> And, and and many others. <laughs> I didn't think you guys would show up. Well, we would miss your party. No, I mean, I don't remember putting you on the guest list. Huh. Well, uh, Ted told us about it. Excuse me. Ted! What? Why would you tell us Luke? <clears throat> I, 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 what are you doing? Anyway. So, Tim, as you know, we aren't too keen on IMDb trivia. But it was a cool little supposedly Easter egg that, you know, Dante wanted to have the cast of Predator voice the Commando Elite. I yeah. did uh, enjoy the cast, but that would have been that would have been an amazing little Easter egg. <laughs> when they're introduced for the first time, I'm like, all right, that's Dylan, that's Arnold, that's um, fuck, Jesse Ventura. Yeah, which I still like how they ended up getting some of the cast of the Dirty Dozen, and then I like how even. At the end in the credits, they even say the original cast of the Dirty Dozen and then list their names along with it. That's pretty much what it is. They just swap movies. And, the, and then all of the Gorgonites um, were mostly all like the, the Christopher Guest crew and whatnot. Because it's like, and cast of this is Spinal Tap as. So I found that amusing. I never saw that movie. Spinal Tap, you yeah. know. So we already talked about Joe Dante, um, but the, the writers on this, Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio, did, as we mentioned in our first, or uh, like second episode, they were the writers for Little Monsters. And then they... they were, kind of, I didn't see that. Little Monsters was one of the first things they did. Because I looked through, Ted Elliott has a massive writing portfolio, but I didn't actually see that. All I saw was Shrek, the pirate movies, and Aladdin TV shows. Yep. And movies. Because Ted and Terry worked together on Shrek, Aladdin, Pirates of the Caribbean series, and they both got their start um, with Little Monsters. Oh, huh. And, and then the other Aladdin two, was Gavin right Scott after. and Adam Rifkin, I didn't notice a single thing worth mentioning. Yeah, I only know Adam Rifkin from Detroit Rock City, because he directed that. I also only looked at their writing creds. That makes sense. If he directed that. That's a big movie. Yeah, he managed to do that without doing anything else for is he even known as a writer um i don't know i don't follow him closely i just remember the name from like him popping up on other podcasts and then like his work on detroit rock city hmm. i i don't yeah. know like i always in my head would think of it as like a alternative like dazed and confused as far as a period piece road like hangout movie what if that movie holds up I haven't seen it since it came out. I was probably, again, too young to see it, but saw it anyway. We have a newfound appreciation for that time period now anyway, too. Because I know if I rewatched Empire Records, I would get more of an appreciation out of it. It was trendy to like it back then, but now, especially with just my own personal growth, I feel if I were to go back and watch that and some of the other movies akin to it, I think it would be a little bit better of a watch. Yeah, because now it's like the 90s as a time capsule as opposed to... It was a hangout movie at a record store back then. Now it's like, no, now it's a, a 90s period thing going on. It's a little bit of nostalgia. I love Empire Records. Hmm. I did like it when it came out, but exactly how you said it felt more like a hangout period movie at that point. Yeah. But now it's I would probably look at it entirely differently. So I think it goes without saying that the effects in this movie were with Stan Winston. Does it go without saying? I mean, we should say it. No, we should never say it. You should just look at these and know. <laughs> but like Nick Tim, said... You like, hold the bar too high for us. All the switches that they were doing with some of the stuff in the movie on um, how it was going to end up being done, I guess they had a bigger plan for more puppet effects. And then they went the route of like CGI in parts in combination with puppet. Because it was which, easier. Rewatching this like looks terrific. I think it still holds up. Yeah, the CGI held on by a, a very thin thread for most of the movie, but the actual in um, the real puppetry that happened, I thought, 
worked out pretty well. More IMDb trivia that was mentioned too is that the studio was used to making massive scale dinosaurs at this point and then they had to change gears to making t-rexes and triceratops to this yeah because the lost world had just come out that was what they were working on before Mm -hmm. this so yeah instead of making a velociraptor whose eyes and you know snout can snarl to a a 12 inch action figure that can you know do all of the things that it does in the movie is pretty intense which i think it ends up benefiting from the fact that it's an action figure like a a toy movie just because the cartoonish aspect of the design of the toys themselves ends up being less apparent when you're looking at like the combination of the puppetry and the cgi as opposed to if they were doing i don't know like the face in the mummy when he transforms and whatnot like because it tries to be more realistic it becomes a little more apparent of what parts are cgi whereas this it ended up blending a bit better And I'm not going to mention any of the cast because we will probably discuss them as we go through this. There's a lot of people in this. So many people All I will say about the cast, did I mention that in the line? Yeah, the movie has an all-star cast once more, uh, including many both in front and behind the camera. So if it's not a voice credit for somebody, it's they're in front of the camera, which is great to see. So yeah, there's there's just a ton of people. I recognize the uh, best boy too. He did good good stuff on this. I think it was somebody's nephew. Did you did you see the um, toward the end of the movie? But did you see the continuity error that they did? I did not. You could see the film crew in a mirror. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, when Phil Hartman's showing off his big screen TV at the end of the movie, the camera um, pans to the right. And just as it's uh, panning over, you could see that the camera's on a dolly and all the whole film crew is right behind the camera. <laughs> well, it would have been great in the reflection, you see all of them dive out of frame. I would say this movie is pure trash now, then. I can't. I'll never watch it again. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> you side with the Gorgonites, then, don't you? Wait, yes. <laughs> we're supposed to, right? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I think Dean has big chip hazard energy. <laughs> <laughs> You're a brick bazooka kind of guy. Uh, Yeah, because that's a... Uh, oh, what's his name? No brick bazooka? George George Kennedy. Yep. From Cool Hand Luke and Creepshow 2, but just the first segment. And mainly the Naked Gun series and Police Squad. <laughs> I, like... I know we'll get into it in the movie, but I loved all the voice acting from, like, the like Christopher Guest crew of um, and Frank Langella for the Gorgonites, but especially all of the work on the commandos for Chip Hazard's crew, just because I'm so used to seeing all these actors like uh, Bruce Stern and Ernest Borgnine doing all these other roles. And then just to hear them having fun with this of just doing like the commando toys that it, it doesn't at any point sound like they're just phoning it in. It's all like they're, they're having, having a great fun. time. Yeah. Yeah. Damn, you can see the boom mic and everything in that show. Because <laughs> <laughs> they did one of those things in movies that they never do, and it's a camera going directly in front of a mirror. It's it's granted, it, it, yeah, it's a slim, it's like a eight inch wide, tall mirror, like behind the shelves in the entertainment center. But yeah, once you that mirror out, was more revealing than Sharon Stone and Basic Instinct. <laughs> that had such a shot. That you can see everything. Yeah, that's funny. So our movie tonight begins with a military drum line beating away as the title cards play. Lasers begin etching the movie's logo before an infomercial begins playing. This reminds me of like the, the clamp company from Gremlins. And I do see a lot of the similarities and callbacks to Gremlins through the movie periodically, not to mention all the Gremlins Easter eggs that are oh, directly yeah. like in the it. gizmo in the dumpster. Mm-hmm. Supposedly, the trivia said that there was a gremlin skull on Alan's desk, but I didn't. I didn't see it. Oh, I must have missed that then. I looked. I. It was not obvious, and if it was there, it was like on the shelf, out of focus, and out of shot for most of it. So I was mostly paying attention to all of the music posters in Alan and Christie's room throughout this movie. We'll get to it. I liked her room better. <laughs> she had like Led Zeppelin a lot more, like 
cooler stuff i felt i didn't recognize most of the stuff in alan's room but global tech also had some like nova vibes as well from short circuit nova no no I feel like it was the the very quintessential 80s big business kind of deal just taken into the the polished 90s now yeah right it's like the evolution of like nova got sold out by global tech and then they've been just doing this ever since so the commercial just mentions on how um, global tech has its hands in like high-tech weaponry for military use and consumer products as well and then we see here that also that the owner of the company is uh Gil Mars, played by Dennis Leary, who is perfectly Dennis Leary throughout the entire movie. It's made me wonder, like, I know he had gone on and done other, lots of other gigs after this, but I'm like, where's Dennis Leary now? Why isn't he playing, like, some asshole in a movie still? Like, is he still working? Well, the bigger question for me is, who makes a kid's movie in the mid-90s and decides, I saw Dennis Leary stand up. Bring him in. I think this might have been a leftover of the teenager aspect, True, or it could be yeah. for the parents too. It's the same thing they do with like um, Chris Rock in Lethal Weapon Four, which came out like the same weekend or whatever, of casting a comedian a role. Mm. But in the like the nineties, for some reason, or like into the two thousands, they would always at least have one scene where they end up just going on a rant, like they would for one of their normal stand up bits. Because Dennis Leary does it here, and then like in Lethal Weapon 4, Chris Rock does the same thing when he's talking about like telemarketers. And it just seems like it's a quick two-minute just stand-up routine for them, and then it goes right back into it. You know, that was my first Lethal Weapon. <laughs> so I, <laughs> <whew>. <laughs> I watched it when it came out, and I liked it a lot. And that's what eventually got me to watch My mom's not going to let me watch Lethal Weapon True. 1. That has a much bigger tone difference than 4. 4 was still rated R and violent as hell, but it didn't have the 80s yeah, R. Yeah, true. It's, it's like a hard 80s R. I mean, De Dennis Lear was in The Sandlot in 93, and that's a kid's true. comedy kind of movie. So. Mm -hmm. You're wrong. And Operation Dumbo Drop? Come on. And Judgment Night? Actually, yeah, Dennis Leary was just crushing it throughout 90s. Yeah, like I said, like I think there's still a world where he could... I don't know why he does. Maybe he just doesn't want to act anymore. It's like doesn't they have to? But I miss it, Dennis Lee. Has has he been canceled? I don't know. I haven't has he said something? It's just uh... how can you cancel the guy that literally <laughs> says that he's an asshole? I mean, that's right. that's just feeding into his yeah, whole, I guess it depends his whole on thing. The, the manner. I really did like him in that show, Rescue Me. Yeah, that was the biggest thing to me that he's been known or done for, like in last 10 years or whatever but in any case mm. in terms of them casting comedians for yeah. employees at this place <laughs> yeah like like you mentioned like we have dennis leary as gil mars and then as um erwin and larry the two like employees from the the marketing and tech division we have david cross and jay mower not not children friendly either at all no <laughs> no I don't remember if this came out before or after uh, Men in Black 2. I think Men in Black 2 was like early 2000s. Men in Black 2, I thought, was yeah, oh, yeah, 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 early 2000s. Yeah, because I remember David Cross, whenever he did pop up, from a child's perspective, I did like him a lot. But I think it stems from this movie, thinking he's innocent. <laughs> and this is well before his time doing like Arrested Development and seeing his original... Um, comedy show oh, yeah, was it was on what, mr show or something like that yeah with bob odenkirk mm -hmm. that was in the 90s i believe yeah yeah so that was outside of my whole bubble so i how innocent i was back then i thought david cross was pretty good in this i mean jay moore too they both job. they both played yeah the parts great uh you know jay moore well. was like the perfect 90s smarmy businessman <laughs> slightly sleazy irresponsible yeah like later in the movie I when he gets his comeuppance, cast. it's like, oh, it's enjoyable. Sorry, we didn't really get into the first scene, did we? Like, I'll let you get to that. I was going to start talking about it, but you go ahead. I mean, not much happens in the first minute. <laughs> well, not, I mean, I'm sorry, the boardroom, like the, the meeting scene, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, like, David Cross um, sees the helicopter land. He's driven to panic as Leary is now early. And um, he meets up. He grabs all his stuff. He runs into the hallway to go meet up with um, Leary in the boardroom, and that's when he meets Jay Moore. So they're in the meeting room, and that's when Leary enters 
and they realize that the whole place is empty. And Leary points out that basically after the buyout, he cleared out all the original staff members of the company, including the board. And he, you can tell he's just in this for profit. And he does play it pretty well as that zero bullshit executive type. Yeah. And I felt he was definitely perfectly cast for this uh, for this role. He's not in it often, but every time he is, I think he definitely sells I it. I thought he came across... He comes across as an asshole, but it's at the same time, he's like... he's He wants to not falsely advertise. He's like, I'm sick of shit, like, saying they can... Showing showing us things yeah. they can't do. And he's like, no, we're going to So they can actually, actually punch out of the box this. like that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Then why do we show it? <laughs> We're protected by legal. Like, yeah, like I agree. He, they seem like he's going to be the big jerk boss and he is arrogant, but then he comes in and throughout the movie, like he himself isn't really overly mean. Like if I recall, he's not like bad to the staff or anything. It's just, he's clearly here for, yeah, let's make a buck. Yeah. You can see how he got to his position, Mm -hmm. but he's not like trying to screw anybody over really. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Like not, not to jump the gun, but at the for all the screw ups, Erwin and Larry don't even get in trouble at the very end. <laughs> yeah, no, He's yeah. just like yeah, they got lucky. We'll pivot. With it. New idea. <laughs> Whereas, how much money he probably just cost them? Uh, anybody else would have been fired, but. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's like, yeah, second chances. Let's go, guys. So, like this, this whole thing of as Irwin's trying to pitch his toy idea to Gil, and he's showing all the cutouts of the characters. My brain was just like, oh my God, I remember all of these now. Because I had always remembered Archer and Chip, because it's like, yeah, they're the main characters. But then I started remembering all the other characters in this and remembering like, oh yeah, like I had an Insaniac figure. I had the Frankenstein figure. Um, we had a Brick Bazooka figure. Slam fist. So, yeah. Well, I didn't have a slam fist, but... <laughs> I like... Where... Irwin's line here when he's like pulling out drawings he's like so flabbergasted and like nervous he's like all right uh here's I drew up some pictures that's a picture you can have there's a all right uh (laughs) (laughs) he just like doesn't know what to they're just thrown in that meeting and he's just so nervous and awkward it's funny it's a cool way to see the style between jay moore and um david cross because he's that fidgeting nervous guy and then just you know jay comes over he drops that cool briefcase down onto the table slides it up and he's like this is what we're doing instead yeah and immediately sells dennis leary on it like that that is presentation perfectly starts a commercial and it just really gave me um (laughs) like the the commercial in the boardroom and scrooged vibes of when he's sitting there watching it's like the night the reindeer died kind of deal it's just the very uh corporate military and then that's the whole rant of like if they can't punch their box why are we gonna advertise it like that <laughs> but i like how when he's sold on the idea of the commando toys and then he's like now these guys are soldiers right and what do soldiers need hats cam cam camouflage miss kegel enemy sir <laughs> <laughs> we can stick a nuclear warhead up a guy's ass 7,000 miles away. We can make these toys <laughs> punch through a carton. Well, so... Yeah, I wish. So he's... Like, they are sold now on the idea, and he makes the Gorgonites the villains to the commandos. And then his whole, like, end of this spiel before he walks out the door, they're like, oh, don't you think it's gonna be a problem with all the <clears throat> violence? And he's like, oh, just call it action. Kids love action. It sells. And he's looking at the camera, and it's like, it's not so subtle. It's a little meta. <laughs> yeah, yeah. David David Cross's like gentle, nonviolent, you know, passive nature is kind of the like the underlying like things should be more like this kind of like stance in the film. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I'm not. I'm, yeah, I'm just it's like Tim saying it's like they're hammering that what sells and like violence is what sells. But no, we should you know. Be more like Archer. Find your Gorgon. Leary leaves the <clears throat> the conference, and just as they leave as well, um, the executive assistant comes up and telling him they have, what, three months to get it out onto shelves? Yeah, I remember it was like half the time they need. Mm-hmm. 
another fun little Easter egg. The password that David Cross has given Gizmo is obviously uh, a reference to Dante's gremlin history. Then later that night, we see Jay Moore researching the tech needed to power and run the Commando Elite. And, of course, he had forgotten his own. I, hmm? I was just going to say, it's, it's like, all right, guys, here's your access to all of our tech. Like, just like, here's your, your top level, like, clearance. Like, <laughs> like go. Get, get whatever you here's want. Here's your password on a sticky note. <laughs> I thought that was a bit much. Like, y'all are toy makers. Security's Baby Town Frolics, considering that all it is is just a single five character yeah, password. Nothing true. special, no uppercase, just gizmo. Like, okay. You can brute force. Super with that. secure. And they have top down clearance to the. To well, the plus to the, the fact company. that he, there's even an option when Jay Moore is going on and, like, first of all, he's using like, the power of 90 search functions of just like three bars and he types in, like, chips, state of the art. And then I forgot whatever his third search term was. And then there was just, so yeah, then there's just an option for like bill to account and it just automatically bills it and orders it all with a five character password. Yeah, he's got a great, I mean, he's that Gilmar is super trusting. He's got a really good internal software system. Like there's no muss, no fuss, user friendly. He's a great businessman. It's, that's how he got to where he is. Everything he does just works. Until now. So being a tech guy, I thought it was really cool that it actually showed the specs to the microprocessor, the X1000. And I spent a little too much time researching the difference between that and other tech of comparable nature of that same time period. Just to see, like, is this really worth the military budget that they think that this thing is supposed to be, like, the next best thing? And um, it's really not. <laughs> A Pentium 2 processor is about the same. And it, I, I, I think it fudges some of the numbers. Oh, yeah. I'm into tech, and I thought all the number crunching was actually pretty cool to see. You don't really get to see that kind of stuff. And usually, if you ever do, it's always like... Fake. Completely fudged and fake, and it, it it's complete jargon. But this actually had stuff that matched up. Like, hey, this thing is SD RAM? Holy shit. No kidding. <laughs> and anyway, um, J. Moore... All I know is, this got me to buy the toys. Yeah. <laughs> And I remember them being beefier, like, than all the rest of my figures. So Chip Hazard just manhandled all of the Justice League as a kid. Just because he had, like, a good four inches on them. Well, everything yeah, did else they make is him just true a toy. Or somewhat... Did they make them somewhat true to scale to the um, movie? The, I, I think they may have had ones that were closer like to scale. eight or ten inch figures. But, yeah, because the ones I had weren't, like, the electronic talking ones. They were just, like, the action figures of them. But they were still like, I don't know, <laughs> built like a brick shit house. Like Chip Hazard was <laughs> probably, I don't know, like two times as wide as my other figures and three inches taller. The thing that always got me was, and Toy Story is just as guilty of this. If you're going to make a movie based on toys and when it finally comes time to marketing toys to sell in the real world based on the movie, make one that's one to one. Obviously, the toys in this movie are way too fictitious that we couldn't make something like this at a reasonable price tag. And, you know, take out the violent tendencies aside, just to make a toy that could, like, theoretically smash its way through its case. But just a voice-activated toy that can move on its own, that kind of thing. Obviously, none of that could work, but at least if you're going to make it, make it the same scale. And even like Buzz Lightyear bothered me a lot because it's not one-to-one. -one. They add features where it didn't exist in the original toy and it couldn't do certain things that the original toy did that like it should be able to. Like every Buzz Lightyear, the, the bubble helmet can never fully retract into its body. But in the, the movie, it can. Like, why can't you do that? And that's just my own personal pet peeve of like, I really wish they just finally did that, but they never seem to. And even to this day, if you were to buy Why can't a, they punch out of the box? Well, I mean, for the price of hot toys that, nowadays, you would expect them to, but... <laughs> I have a note that, like, from what I understand, and from a robotic auto-transforming Optimus Prime that came out that cost about $700, this these toys should be at least $2,000 each. <laughs> Easy. 
<laughs> with the well, advanced that's why with he... the advanced uh nature of them like that's they're really maybe underselling why... it it's 80 bucks a pop that's what when they were Timmy selling was like i found what i want and christy's like my parents will never buy this for you <laughs> Well, in fairness, yeah, she's end, just immediately like, movie. she's just like, no, he never gives a number. <laughs> at the very, at the very end of the movie, um, Dennis Lurie is like, "How much are we selling these for?" They're like eighty dollars. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's well, what probably like, she's like, she's like, he's like, at, he's like, add a couple zeros and sell them to the military, <laughs> or sell them to the. We'll get to that part later. I won't Even thinking there. about it though, can you imagine in the nineties spending eighty dollars on one action figure? Well, we did, but it wasn't yeah. a figure. It was usually a playset because I'm pretty sure, like the Millennium Falcon playset, was about that much. I don't know how much the Batman, um, Batcave figures were, not the figure, but or like, like the, the, the Megazord with yeah. all the individuals that combine and yeah, because I, I I don't know what those original numbers were because I'd imagine they'd be at least over thirty forty bucks each. It's hard to imagine inflation in my own day-to-day because when i look at toys now at target and all that i see the price tag i'm like i'm not spending 20 30 dollars on this when in reality it's like it's it's not the 90s anymore nick they're not going to be like three four dollars a pop they're going to be a little more expensive because you know a little thing called inflation yeah i love seeing on like the vintage uh carded turtles figures it's like kb toy is like 2.99 like oh shit yeah i (laughs) fucking wish i mean granted the technology (laughs) back the technology and tooling is much more advanced than I mean they can make it look cheap if they wanted and they're not charging four dollars anymore. They they but use for modern how good they look today. They use modern it's, molds it's, for the same toy line and they're still charging like thirty, forty dollars for that shit. Yeah. The, well those Playmates re released those turtles and they're thirteen they three ninety nine instead of four. Yeah. yeah. Bastards. I don't have an inflation calculator, but I'm not concerned. Yeah. To find out. But I definitely would have. But I, <laughs> I would have spent they, that much for that. When they cut to after he buys the microprocessor, like the manufacturing process, I was like, "There's a like a draw the rest of the fucking owl step here that's like missing." <laughs> from that. Like I know you don't want to spend the whole time showing, yeah, how it goes into it, but just we got the processors and now they're fully walking, talking robotic toys. Like what the hell? What, what, yeah, I mean, wouldn't does... there be programming involved beyond just like having a really good processor? <laughs> just plug it in. The there's thing a, that got there's me... a suspension of disbelief later with the Barbies, but you know. Yeah, the uh, the thing that got me is at the end of the movie when David Cross is talking to um I forget which toy, and he says the toy says a line that David Cross is like, hey, you know, my grandmother used to say that, and then it dawns on him like, this is my toy. Of course he knows, but at the same time, like, why don't you know this? Yeah, how much direct yep. impact that they had over this whole project because it seems like all right, we need to make this. Here's the art design. Go nuts, and then that's it. I get that the budget time was cut in half, but still, you would have think that you would have been able to play with it at least once. <laughs> but I don't know. here's a production sample. Print it. It's out the door. It was fucking cool to see though that this the 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 3D printing technology is not fake whatsoever. Yeah, that was interesting to me to be like, I know home 3D printers are new in the last, you know, uh, six, seven years, eight years. But like, I didn't realize that was a technology that was just around before that, like just in an industrial sense. Yeah, like the It 80s, looked like resin printing. It was. Yeah. yeah, the 80s have had that kind of printing for since about then, but it's been mainly um, a production tool and it's only recent that the commercial that that it's commercially available to consumers and especially at the size because like that that size printer is fucking huge it's huge and you could they do (laughs) make one now that you can print like the best thing i could think of is like to print cosplaying helmets out of um for something that size you could but it's stupid expensive so for them to have something like that makes perfect sense in the you know in a production facility, but to have that kind of thing at home, yeah, you're looking at like two three thousand right now. But it's cool to see that it's it's it it's a hundred percent real. That that was not a fake shot. So that's cool. Like right. it even has like yeah, it had uh, like the supports, like mm-hmm. the support uh, pieces on it. Yep. So after the 
toys are being shot and made, um, we cut over to our main protagonist, Alan Abernathy. He rides through the town center to his dad's toy shop. And we see here pretty quickly that public interest in the shop is pretty low and kids never shop there because they think it's kind of boring. I mean, even looking around in the shots that are shown, a lot of the toys compared to like, nothing is like no turtles, no Star Wars, no commercially branded stuff, probably because it would have been expensive to market and license that type of stuff to be shown in this movie. But um, realistically, just the father is just kind of like an old school guy. He doesn't want any kind of modern hip toys in his shop and he wants some of the more yeah, wholesome. Yeah, it's all like wooden toys and dolls and things like that. Yeah. yeah, It's like that store at the mall. It's like happy time toys and you're like, cool. And it's like, where's the G.I. Joe's? Yeah. <laughs> it's all educational stuff. I don't want to stay here. <laughs> Lego gets like a an in only because it works as like a building educational toy even though it's not. It's the one recognizable thing they have. Yeah. Usually. Connects was far superior. <laughs> It's one of those guys. I had an erector set. Um, Did you see a doctor about that? that... <laughs> <laughs> hey, we all had that time in our life. <laughs> Happens to everybody. This uh, The town he rides through, all these towns in these movies, I know there's a mix of backlot shots, but I'm just like, this looks like the ideal, idyllic like little just town to live in. It looks so friendly and peaceful and nice. And I want to ride my bike through this town on my way to work at the toy shop. For a quick second, I thought it was going to be the the Back to the Future set. It almost looked a lot like of this looked like it, but then it he turned like a, a bend, and I'm like, okay, it's not the same shot or not the I same. I think the location. first shot is actually location. Because I've never seen a backlot that has like a roundabout town center. I don't think that, I think that was real. Huh. But then I think the toy shop is in his house, is definitely on a lot. It is the Warner Brothers lot, so there's parts. Yeah, and of, then I think parts were filmed in Orange, um, California or whatever. Oh, okay, maybe that's where that yeah, where that uh, roundabout I mean, all, town. I mean, all of these is. have a very specific look, like between the town in Gremlins, between like the the town in Matinee, between the town in um like the burbs even though all of them are distinct all of them have that same like small town or like home mm -hmm. feel to them it's like we're doing another joe dante movie and they just pull out like <laughs> here's four sets pick one it's warner brothers open well, let's go yeah we do get a uh, speaking of joe dante stuff that they pull out whenever he's doing a new movie dick miller it is terrific to see him pop up in things, especially seen as he's like one of Joe Dante's um, oh, yeah. regular conspirators. Um, I loved him as Joe, the delivery guy in this. He stole the scene. Yeah, I really liked good. him in it. I oh, love yeah. that whole bit where, you know, the toy shop is not doing great. Um, Joe makes the delivery. And um, when they see all the, the new toys going to the local Toys R Us, basically, you know, they open it up and they're really surprised on how cool this was and he asks them like hey man come on like can you front me a load of these can you you know just say it fell off the back of the truck and i love joe's response the like, truck? i don't like your tone sorry it's too loud <laughs> he just like if he was the delivery guy when i was still working retail like i would chat with him and hang out like he he seems like a bud yeah like i like how alan was complaining he's like yeah we should just torch the place for the insurance and he's like Arts and forensics nowadays, very sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> he leans in like, will you front me these? Your tones, you're too loud. We should be funneling drugs through these dolls. <laughs> <laughs> I know a guy, if your dad's not making enough money, I can uh, set you up. <laughs> you ever see that movie White Boy Rick? That could be you. <laughs> hasn't even been made yet. I do like that he comes with this delivery and it's just like, What's in these? I don't know. Let's open them up. They just started taking the toys out. Like, <laughs> yeah, they're very... He doesn't have a problem with that. <laughs> very loosey-goosey about it. <laughs> I'm more amazed that you're able to open up the toys so easily as they did. Well, they yeah, punch they... out of their own box. No, I mean the, the humans. <laughs> you know how difficult it is opening some of that shit? Or then they have the, the plastic thing that, like, the twist ties around each arm, each leg, around the neck, around the waist. Yeah, and here it's just the waist. 
And it just pops yeah. the bubble off. Just pops it right off. E- That's why I... I miss those action figures that it was like the X-Men ones that it was just the the plastic bubble and you just pull it apart from the cardboard and there you go. Well, usually you pull it apart and then you don't do it correctly. So there's still a thin layer of cardboard. So you have to poke it with your finger. Mm -hmm. As a child, I was very (laughs) particular about opening it properly because I didn't want to damage the the cardboard because i always liked how like the front and the back always had like the information on it yeah and i always thought it was cool i used to save them so i would like very carefully <laughs> from a young age try to like get the plastic front off without damaging the rest of it like i'm gonna reseal this later <laughs> yeah. sell it for a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> yeah so alan walks to the front and sees kirsten dunce walk in with her brother um i'm not gonna go too heavy into the the flirting that's done back and forth, but Alan has the hots for this girl. And there's a lot of lame flirting through the whole movie, but it's so like <laughs> tertiary to the whole plot point that it's just, it's there. So Alan has the hots for her doing a breath check. Um, they talk a little bit, but we follow the little brother instead. And he walks in on, so when Joe came in, they unloaded the truck and they were not playing with, but, you know, they took Archer and Chip Hazard out of their boxes just to see what, you know, what they're about. And when Alan went to go unload the rest of the truck of the toys, Chip started to interrogate Archer. And this is where the kid walks in on to see that, you know, the action figures are interacting with each other. The commando elite will rid the earth of the Gorgonites. The Gorgonites are peaceful. We mean no harm. And just as he's like, oh, what's this? That's cool. Chip shoots him with something. I guess he has like a little gun that has a projectile in it. Declare your allegiance. Uh, hey, cool. He's got a whole woodworking chopper back. Oh, yeah. yeah. A soldier. But instead of fear, the kid realizes he wants one instead. Like, that is kind of cool. Like, holy shit. Hey, what's going on here? And the toy shoots you. <laughs> I'm into this. This is cool. Just imagine. Just imagine him like just. What if he just shot the kid in the head with some like a nail gun? <laughs> oh <my> just God. <laughs> takes a bad turn right it away. It cuts back to them talking in the other room, and you just see the body, like, boom, right onto in his In the back. background, like, naked gun style. Like, they don't notice it. It just falls down. <laughs> Identify yourself, civilian. <laughs> oh, God. Joe, help us. It's too loud. <laughs> we got to get him into these boxes. I know a guy who will take this. <laughs> we'll be selling them in parts in Toy World by tonight. It's not on my usual route. It's going to cost you extra. You don't want to go to jail, do you, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so here's where, um, you know, Kristen Dunst asks, like, how much are they? And Alan admits that oh, they're just expensive. And as he's finally packing everything away, he realizes that his dad who owns the shop, left his plane ticket in the store, and he's like, oh, crap, I got to bring this to my dad. He locks up the shop, and then he runs out the door. And then here we meet Alan's parents. His dad is kind of high-strung and dealing with just a ton of stress. Oh, what is the matter with me? What else? Stuart, please, try to relax. Now, remember why we moved here? To get away from the stress? To eliminate the stress? To... Exhale. Exhale. The stress. stress. And it's when we hear that um, there's a bunch of noise outside and his dad goes out to see who it is. And it's our favorable and much loved Phil Hartman up on a ladder wanting to cut down his tree for his new TV satellite. I, The dad, Kevin, is played by Kevin Dunn, who I don't think I see him much anymore either. But I think he's a pretty solid like dad figure. Just like oh, yeah, do think- character acting. Pretty yeah, Kevin Dunn is definitely one of those actors, and it's like he'll pop up in something, and I'll be like, "Oh, hey, this is terrific." Yeah, he was the dad but in Transformers, I... right? Yeah, he, I believe so. Yeah, he was the mo- more entertaining part of that movie, I think, for me. Him I think he was in Ghostbusters appearance. too, as well. Is that him? I can't recall. But come on, Hollywood, more Kevin Dunn. He's still alive, right? I think he's alive. You know, it was heartbreaking though when I saw Dick Miller pop up and it's like well i knew he was in this just because it's a joe dante movie i'm like i love dick miller someday if i write a script i would love to cast dick miller in it 
I wonder what he's up to now. And it's like he died in 2019. I'm like, oh. Sad. It's a terrible way to find out. Uh, also, Kevin Dunn, not to be confused with the fixture at WWE for more than 20 years. Um, wrong Kevin Dunn. There's another. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> He was in he was in Ghostbusters too. He was on the That's World of him, Psychic then. TV show that um, Venkman was hosting. I knew it. Mm-hmm. I didn't know it. Huh. So well, they have a kind of an exchange back and forth. Phil Hartman wants to cut down the tree for his beautiful satellite dish. Kevin Dunn wants the tree to stay up because that is indeed beautiful instead. And just the urgency of Optimal having... Optimal placement. Right. Well, it's it's odd that it's even an argument because the tree is literally on the Abernathy property. And it didn't look like the branch was coming over across his side. It was just there. And Phil had mentioned like, oh, well, I guess if we really get into zoning, you'd see that they'd side with me. And it's like, the tree's not on your property. The branch was, though. Oh, it, it's, it didn't look like the branch was crossing over onto his side. I'm not going to fact check it. But yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, neither am I. The guy's continuing on his scumbag kind of routine. But at least this time it's less skeezy and more just annoying neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. It's fickle. Even toward the end of the movie, it's like all the all the loud noises and stuff that people would obviously call the cops for and it's just like oh, it's that guy again and they just raise up the tv volume instead like how bad do you have to be with your home surround sound for your neighbors to hear them through your wall through their walls and just raise their own tv volume like that's that's something else yeah <laughs> i like how when they're um arguing over the tree and the the father stewart he's like Give me that saw for a second, Phil. <laughs> and then his wife grabs him. <laughs> so the dad gets to his car. He starts loading it up. And that's when Alan shows up. It's like, dad, dad, you know, here's your plane ticket. He gives it to him. And I guess Alan is kind of coming of age. He's tired of being treated like a kid. But then again, from the adult standpoint, I get it. Where it's like, yeah, um, his daddy even says the line later on, like, you know, me dad you son like that's this is how this works yes i'm coming to check up on you yes i don't fully trust you and he's just getting fr- the kid's getting frustrated though because you know he locked up he did everything correctly but he's still constantly second guessed and i think it which also like i feel like a lot of movies well, well a lot of movies and a lot of life does that of the parents have a business so it's just yep you're our kid you're going to be responsible for this business too and it kind of is unfortunate for him to be thrust into, like, maybe he doesn't want to spend his days, like, at the family store, kind of watching over things and taking care of stuff. If he gets ownership of that store, he's he's either selling it immediately or immediately changing it over to sell more modern toys. Because I have a good feeling he's not going to keep any of that. Yeah. Depending on how long ago his prior incidents happened... He might need some, you know. Oh, true. Yeah, I some, forgot about that. <laughs> some punish, not punishment, but punishment slash, like you need to atone for what he did. <laughs> Atonement. <laughs> Penance is what he needs. Penance. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I forgot that they say he what like he when they're talking about um, Christy hearing like all these things about him, and it's yeah, like, oh, like on. those aren't true, and it's like but I heard you called a bomb threat on like your school or something. And you did like this other set fire to something else. And he's like, Oh, well those things I did. It's like, how you look like you're 12. When she first says like, he's like, I got kicked out of two schools. And it's like, that's, you got to do something pretty serious. Like if it's a public school, especially to be like kicked out, like what did you do? <laughs> yeah. I guess there was deleted scenes scare. where he, he had to speak with the principal and it just they kind of really hammer in that the kid's a delinquent which funny enough through the whole rest of the movie he i don't get that vibe from him at all he doesn't have any kind of delinquent characteristics that would make you second guess his judgment and even getting the toys to quote unquote fall off the back of a truck it's done earnestly to help his store 
while his dad is gone because he knew these things would sell pretty quick. Right. Yeah, he doesn't. It just seems like he's like I'm. I'm a different person now, and it's like, yeah, you are because I don't see why you would have done any of those things in the past. <laughs> Old Alan's dead. This is new Alan, pretty much. <laughs> but and plus, like, I feel like digress. it doesn't change the rest of the movie overall because, like, what other than her having like a different opinion of him when she meets him or her boyfriend Brad or whatever, like being like, oh, aren't you the kid who did yada yada yada? They really don't mention it other than that, other than maybe like calling him into question later on when he's like, oh, it's the toys. And they're like, oh, you're right. on drugs. It just serves to be like why he says that he's never trusted or second guessed. Like why? Like, oh, because you're kicked out of two schools. But why would you do that stuff? No idea. But yeah. So the door was locked when you left? Yes. And did you empty out the cash register? Both quarters and all six pennies. And yes, I shut off the lights. I'm just asking. You know, it's possible that I make it through an entire day without screwing up. Are you kids with your loud music and your Dan Fogelberg, your Zima, hula hoops, and Pac-Man video games? Don't you see? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, when his mom asks him about you know, if he closed the shop up correctly, he gets a bit touchy on the subject. Of course he did. You know, he's just frustrated, constantly having to be monitored, which, I mean, as we mentioned before, you kind of did some bad stuff. You kind of need the extra parenting, if anything. But he, yeah, he, I mean, if anything, I'm surprised that they are letting him close up the store and watch it by himself. Because if he did these things, even if this was like last year that he got kicked out of both schools in the same year kind of deal... But that means what? He's doing these things at like 11, 12? Uh, he goes up to his room. It's a pretty decent room. You know, typical. He has a sweet Power Man 5000 poster on the wall. Did he really? <laughs> Does he? Yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't, didn't see that. Because <laughs> all of a sudden I caught it. I was like, wait, was that a Power Man 5000? And I play it back and I'm like, hey. Yeah, all I saw really cool. was that um, Man or Astro Man poster. Oh. <laughs> and that's the only thing that kind of drew my attention. And then the whole rest of the time I was looking for that gremlin skull, but I didn't see it. I think they meant he himself had a gremlin skull. Like if they were to x-ray him. <laughs> well, you never see him get wet. We engineered him eat. specifically for this film. Apparently he has a piranha. Oh yeah, there is a piranha next to his desk. And I guess yeah. Joe Dante oh, yeah, that makes piranha. Sense. Yeah. Cheeky little bastard. That Joe Dante. Yeah. <laughs> He realizes there's something in his backpack, and when he goes to check on it, he realizes that it's Archer. And they have the quick exchange of the, you know... Halt! Who goes there? Greetings. I am Archer, emissary of the Gorgonites. The two have a brief exchange, and for a second it feels like the toy is just reciting the same thing over and over again, which I always felt to be any of those voice-activated toys. All those modern... Like, oh, check out this cool thing this toy does, like, that's electronic. That's pretty much how I feel about every single one. It's like you have such high expectations, and then you realize that this thing is really just, it's got, like, three programs built into it, and that's really it. But then, um, yeah. after a second, when um, Archer asks for Alan's name, you know, being coy, he just responds with, you know, Alan, now shut up. And Archer actually <laughs> recites Alan's full name as that. And that's when it kind of starts dawning on him that maybe there's a lot more to this toy than first expected. And I know I I would be surprised about that. I still don't trust Alexa or Hey Google to be smart about any of that kind of stuff. You just turned on so many people's (laughs) phones and (laughs) tablets. I'm seeing those... um, Hey Google, rate five-star screen refresh. Those... uh, (laughs) Those trolling videos from like Modern Warfare and stuff, like, oh, I just got killed by a guy. What his name was? Um, Xbox, turn off. <laughs> and then, like, you would see like fifteen people disconnect because they have all of the voice activation turned on. What's the old uh, what Alt F four? How do I do this maneuver? Alt F four. <laughs> you would think more people would have learned about that one by this point, but at this point, I feel if you fall for that, you kind of deserved it. You learn the hard way. Pretty much. Tough love. So back at the toy store, Chip Hazard was never deactivated. So we see the full display of the Gorgonites and the Commando Elite. And all of their belt buckles are turned off with the exception of Chip. And we see him punch through his packaging just like the commercial. 
and he begins activating the remaining uh, members of his squad and they in turn all fall in uh, and line up and chip issues out orders to have them arm up and get ready to take out that gorgonite scum i like as he's like getting introduced to all of his unit and he gets to uh nick nitro and nick it's nitro demolition is my mission serve with your father <laughs> That was I so, know that was the only one I noted too. I thought that was funny. Yeah. Well, so for anybody like we mentioned at the beginning, it's the some of the cast of the Dirty Dozen, some other voice actors is the Commandos. Um, so the the Dirty Half Dozen in this case. So Tommy Lee Jones, Chip Hazard. We have Ernest Borgnine as Kip Killigan. Um, Jim Brown as Butch Meathook. George Kennedy as Brick Bazooka. Clint Walker as Nick Nitro. Bruce Dern as Link Static. Um, another Joe Dante returner. Um, and then we'll get into the Gwendy dolls later as far as the soldier crew. I don't know Clint Walker. I really, he's the only one I didn't really write, you know, know outside of this movie. Yeah. I mean the Clint Walker mainly, I just remember him as Posey from the dirty dozen. Um, but whereas like the rest of them, I remember other things and like other projects like Clint yeah, Walker, everybody else immediately like spring to mind. Yeah. Everybody else I could identify and like, yeah, I've seen a couple things. I remember him more in name than anything else. So as they move out, we jump back over to Alan's home to see Archer watching. Alan now shut up, sleeping. His current status being off, which I I like that um, meta view of the toy's like vision. And they'll have like a status window, like Terminator style. Yeah, it's like the Terminator HUD. Yeah. I like it. So I notice Archer's quiver only has two arrows. All he needs is two. Hey, if Hawkeye can get like get away with like killing six guys, True. an entire army of aliens going through a portal, and he's just got like a quiver of eleven arrows, I feel is the equivalent of Archer having two. So it's like, Archer, did you use them all? Did you not bring them, or are they trying to lower toy costs for manufacturing by only giving you two arrows? Well, it's like a turtle's thing. He has the arrows, but he never uses any of his weapons through the whole movie. True. I like that. Um. Uh, what did I like? There's something I liked. I like that his um, weapon is just like strapped to his arm, his crossbow. He just like raises his arm to fire. It is. I don't cool. think he ever does that, but like it, that's the purpose it serves. Pretty yeah, cool I think design. he only fires like once in the movie, but it's just to act as a grappling hook. So we're back at the toy store, and Chip Hazard has a patent style speech being given to his crew they're now armed with a bunch of <laughs> screwdrivers knives and other tools found amongst the whole shop and they're ordered to hunt down and destroy the gorgonites and the camera pulls away from the toy store as we hear them start fighting with the gorgonites that are still in their boxes but it fades over to black and we see alan opening the store and then just the place is completely wrecked the the patent speech is funny because it's just pieces of other famous speeches just strung together and in sayings. front of a, an American flag puzzle. <laughs> yeah, Which yeah, it was a great. Originally, Appar- oh good. Apparently the the guy that composed the music for Patton, they had him compose the music just for this scene, <laughs> just to be another level of like the uh, you know, insider movie insider. I don't know. It's a funny little scene. It's a funny, yeah. obvious homage. And, yeah. I mean, the whole movie, I feel it hit better now than it did when I watched it as a kid. Because as a kid, I'm like, oh, yeah, like it's fun. It's a little bit more than I was expecting. But watching it now, I can enjoy the the more action oriented parts, but also enjoy all of these, the jokes and then in jokes within those jokes of everything else going on in terms of references. I mean, when so I was if anything, a- I think this movie works better now. Yeah, when I was, what, 11 or 12, I was like, oh, Harry Shearer and George Kennedy and Ernest Borgnine, like, my favorites. <laughs> That's not, you weren't like that? I mean, okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> As a kid, I had already seen The Dirty Dozen by this point, so I did appreciate that. Uh. So I guess Alan was able to... Um, get the entire shop cleaned up in time Chris even comes by and they you know continue to bond over their own pop culture stuff did they, they mentioned family of five did they mean party of five or was that a real show i think it might have been a like they're made it up and alluding to like party of five yeah because they mentioned led zeppelin afterward and that was real well yeah because they mentioned 
they say like they both don't like Family of Five, but they love X Files and Led Zeppelin. Yeah, that's I true. Wonder Why if would they, they just make that like? Because was DreamWorks affiliated with Fox? Because I know X Files would have been Fox. And if Party of Five was another network, and they weren't allowed to make mention of it. I'm not sure. Yeah, and I didn't my, watch... my thought was they were just alluding to it, but then, duh, yeah, they're making, they're saying other real properties, so maybe it is just a competitor kind of thing, or. And I didn't I watch know. Party of Five either, so the references flew over my head if they were real. Because they were talking down on Party of Five, so they must have been like, "Let's change the name." So. Yeah. Um, the whole shop is pretty much back in working order. Um, I guess during the scuffle, there's like a big wooden boat that comes into play later on in the movie but uh the mast is broken and they kind of haphazardly try to patch it together and that's when his father comes back in unannounced and that's where the exchange happens of like you know me son or uh, you son me dad you know i have every right to come in unannounced and to check up on you and especially like the the more thinking about it especially like kid you you got caught calling a school and raising a bomb threat on top of graffiti <laughs> and all of the other misdemeanors that you have you have no right to be upset about being checked up on can you imagine if his dad walked in and the place was a mess like he got into the shop before alan did yeah, and this, I mean, this this all goes in line with his history. Like, he made a bad decision. Things got to wrecked. It's like, yeah, that's why you need checked up on. Don't be surprised, kid. Mm-hmm. There's a meme I saw of, like, you know you reached adulthood when you side with um, King Triton instead of Ariel when it comes to her <laughs> brash decision of just <laughs> going off and falling in love with somebody. Like, you know you're a kid when you side with Ariel and then... You know you're adult when it's like, no, I don't want my teenage girl going after some guy that I know could be possibly dangerous. No I mean, it's the same concept behind like Romeo and Juliet, a romance. No, it's about like two teenage kids who meet each other for three days and result in like multiple homicides. Yeah. I like that she's like, are you running an insurance scam? <laughs> That's her first thought. <laughs> it's like just... And, yep, you're running an insurance scam. <laughs> Good thing he didn't set fire to anything. They would have known instantly. <laughs> Joe wasn't making that up. Yeah, what if that was his answer instead of, oh my god, we have to fix everything here. It's, oh god, I can't let him find it. Burn it down and we'll say it was an accident. She like she says she, you know, she likes Led Zeppelin and X-Files. And he's like, you're different. You're, like, different than the other girls. I'm like... I think girls today probably probably fit that mold a lot more. I don't know. Is that odd for girls to like... I mean, I feel like I knew a Zeppelin. lot of people back in like <laughs> middle school and whatnot who were classic rock fans and liked X-Files. Alan, hang out with cooler people. I mean, I personally don't like modern pop music, but then again, I wasn't really a fan of pop music even back then. The last pop music I liked was like Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera. And then everything after that, I just stopped listening to completely. Yeah. So I like how after fixing up all of this stuff, just in time for his father to like show up and take a look, the father looks at the boat instantly the that he was making there. Instantly and it's, he's knows. like, what happened here? Yeah. He's like, what happened? <laughs> well, like how he's like this mast here and the mast looks fine. And then he walks over and he grabs it in his hand and just snaps it off. And he's like, it's broken. It's like, no, you did that. Oh, no! It's broken! Oh, you were dusting with what, a croquet mallet? Unless he can just see structural defects from across the room. He is a woodworker, so I'd imagine he probably yeah, true. has intimate knowledge of that boat. And the slightest little thing off about it, he probably was able to pick out. But eagle-eye being able to see that amongst everything else in the store... Pretty sure a couple of the shelves were broken too, but anyway, the plot device thickens as his dad realizes that. Um, Christy senses the tension and awkwardness of the situation, so she kind of <laughs> just books it. I thought it was a little fucked up on how he told her explicitly, you can't take the toy, and she takes the toy while everything is happening. So my thought process was she was going to take it, but then because Alan got <laughs> fed up... Too. He ends up leaving almost immediately after she does. 
So she sees him and then gives her gives him the toy like, oh yeah, I grabbed these for you. Like, did you? I don't believe it. But I'll, <laughs> I, I'll, I mean that I'll let it slide. That was my first thought. Was what you're saying? I was like, wait, does she like? Is she st- like taking the the toy? <laughs> and then I realized she was just like trying to hide it from his, you know, save his ass. Like I did buy outside. that. Yeah. She just socks him in the stomach and she hops on the back of her <laughs> boyfriend's Vespa. Go, 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 go. <laughs> go, go, go. These are 80 bucks a pop. They're pre-release. The, um... <laughs> they broke street date. I love when the boy, the boyfriend is like, are you the kid who burned down his school? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I am. He's like, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Crispy, you gonna come cheer me on at the big game? He moves on pretty fast. <laughs> the big game. Do you want to cheer me on at the big game where I play <laughs> sports ball? <laughs> it's a <like> job simulator. <laughs> yeah, also, like, if she's with this kid, Brad, she seems awfully chummy with Alan the entire time. It skeeved me quite a bit when they're talking on the phone later in the movie. And she's like, he he's obviously trying to flirt and express interest. And she's like, oh, I only date older guys. Like, girl, you are like 14. I don't want to hear yeah, that. Brad's 15. Oh, God. He's a star of the big game. Even in high school, that skeeved me out. Like, I was talking to 17-year-old girls and shit my age. And they're like, yeah, my boyfriend's 22. That's fucking yeah. gross. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I always, I did think that was weird, too. I like the older guys. Yeah. Her boyfriend can. Sure. As a license. <laughs> well, that is a, <laughs> to kill. That is um that is a flex when you are 17 and you have the license. But when the kid's been driving for longer than you've been in high school, I think that's a problem. Which even for that time frame, it's still awkward. But yeah. So in the tree next door, we can see sta- uh, Link Static watching Alan right off from the store on his bike. And we can see now that Alan's being hunted by all of the commando elite and they fire off um, like they have like a squad set up and like as a trap. And as uh, Alan rides by, they fire brick bazooka at Alan's bike using like kind of like a slingshot using a bungee cord. And then we see a quick action sequence of him trying to climb up the bike all the while being chased by some random dog gave me like some indiana jones vibes as he's trying to climb up the bike avoiding the pedals and the chain as it's spinning around all the while trying to avoid the dog that's trying to chew him up i don't know why but at some point my notes i ask is brick bazooka considered a himbo a what a himbo i heard a male bimbo oh is he it's like the the blonde huge doofy brick bazooka yeah what about i originally him? thought he eats it here oh yeah like he died he does yeah. but just he's he recovers he gets <laughs> he got better he got better did you um you noticed my favorite thing here in this scene uh, yes. i'm sure he falls from the bike, gets tangled in the bike chain, and uh, while getting torn apart, we get the complete full-style Wilhelm scream as he falls to the Fucking ground. Wilhelm scream. <laughs> the problem with Wilhelm scream is that, A, it's the same sound that never changed. So, if, like... Imagine um, Isaac Hayes is in an action scene and he falls and you hear the Wilhelm scream. That's not his fucking voice. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it takes me out of the movie all the time. Like, n- Usually nobody's uh, voice fits the Wilhelm scream when they decide to use it. it. It's best if it's a rando stormtrooper, you know, or somebody... Not to give it to somebody who, especially who you, you can hear talking. Like a stunt guy that has no lines or bearing through the entire yeah. movie. And he's yeah, just a stormtrooper. Yeah. <laughs> no point of comparison fire. for the rest of the film. <laughs> it would have been better her. if they gave the Howie scream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! 
You know we get a second one later on, right? I do. I have that noted as well. Yep. I'll get just as angry. I'm going to make a whole segment like just your mortal for you. enemy. What we should do is before like the new year for at the end of every season, it should be a super cut of all the Wilhelm screams from movies throughout the year for our picks. <laughs> It'll be in memoriam. Mm. Yeah. Dean, you want to edit that one up together? Yep, I'll just... All the movies I like, I'll just go and make my own ripped versions and cut that sound out of the movie. <laughs> With blackjack so and hookers. Do it again. <laughs> it's small soldiers, but in this one, the commandos win. <laughs> Sorry if I blinked for a second. Did you mention how fucked up it was that um, Link Static is just killing baby birds just tossing the eggs out of the tree well, oh i just, didn't see that they were just eggs they, i mean they cut well, you... they, <laughs> when they cut from the last scene it just shows like eggs splatting on the ground and it goes up to the tree where link is like looking out and he's just next to a bird's nest so he's just tossing eggs out of the nest. i didn't realize that that's yeah. harsh <laughs> yeah probably the most fucked up thing in the movie I mean, it's... In my opinion. It was either that or it was going to be brick up there with a knife. <laughs> I think the most fucked up thing was the uh, the corn cobs to the leg, but... Or, like, the, the corn cob holders. I was su- well, I was surprised at that, and then I was surprised at when we have... Um, which, actually, we'll, we'll get to it later. I mean, like, corn cobs to the leg, corn cob holders to the leg, you know, that's expected at that point. But here he's just like, there's no reason for him to be just killing these birds. Well, this is brutal. Yeah. You see them like go into his <laughs> leg and he pulls the first one out and you see that it's bloody and like, oh man. There that, is blood. That yeah. that must hurt. <laughs> well, they attack Alan with a saw earlier in the movie that I forgot about. And all of a sudden he just like saw blades his hand and it cuts his hand open. Oh yeah, like the little Dremel. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so uh, Brick loses his legs. I never understood that with like robots and shit and movies and stuff. Like it's not like it's a human being or something with blood inside that the blood loss could possibly kill you. This is a robot, so losing its legs really has no bearing on the rest of its body. It's just not able to walk anymore. So when this happens to Brick, it makes sense that they're able to patch him up. But when it happens later on with, I think, Kip, and he dies from the garbage disposal i never understood like why is he dying that's true his legs got shredded but none of the rest of his innards were affected and all of his stuff is in his head yeah i was gonna say i think well it might have literally been in his head maybe it was psychosomatic nick nitro was convinced (laughs) so much that he was a real man that That losing his legs just killed him it's some serious ai guess so somebody programmed ptsd into most of them (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they talk to David Cross like, wait, why did you do this? <laughs> I'm cursed with these memories and flashbacks. I wasn't alive, but I see, see forests. <laughs> That's why they had that scene of Chip Hazard just like a thousand yards stare off into the distance. <laughs> They're a chopper in the background. So even though Brick Bazooka doesn't make it, um, he, they do know where Alan now lives. And this is reported back to the rest of the commandos as they try to repair him up. But now with Alan back at home, he calls Globotech's customer support to lodge a complaint against the toy line, <laughs> which I think was just funny to even think of. And here we get to see um, <laughs> SNL alum Sherry O'Terry. And fun fact, did you see that her name tag actually has her real name on it? <laughs> no. Yeah. But uh, he tries to talk to her, and she just keeps giving, like, really robotic canned responses. And that's when he just finally asks for an answering machine, and he leaves, like, like a threatening voicemail with a lawsuit and just describing the whole situation. And he leaves his phone number and, you know, hangs up the phone. And the whole thing just has him really upset, and that's where he just lays on his bed, starts listening to music, and he just kind of shuts Archer out as he's trying to talk to alan about the whole thing you're right it says c o terry on her on her name tag i thought that was a cool thing he did i was like sherry o terry too yeah she's perfect in this just little cameo essentially we jump over to global tech 
Jay Moore is leading a meeting for his executives, and it's like a hype meeting. They have all the marketing stuff created already, and they have like a guy in costume of Chip Hazard. Everyone's excited for the impending rollout. They're projecting huge numbers for profit, but that's where David Cross rushes inside and pulls Jay back into their office and showing him the voicemail from Alan. Uh, David's concerned about the voicemail, but Larry isn't concerned because technically the toys aren't, um, you know, the street date hasn't been released yet, so <laughs> they're technically protected. And uh, he knows everything is standard, and he starts lifting off the parts, like, you know, the plastic standard, this is standard, that's standard. Oh. David Cross <laughs> catches that. And, uh... Oh? What do you mean, oh? Oh. What kind of oh? The microprocessors, they realize, is munitions chips instead. I still think <laughs> it's funny to think, like, let's put the same processor that we would put in a tactical warhead into a toy. You would think, like, even from a like a, a real world perspective, they would never do this because the toy line would be immediately bought up by some rebel force just so that they could deconstruct <laughs> the toy and put it into their own weapons. It's like the military buying like ten that like a hundred thousand PlayStation Two units and chaining them together to make a supercomputer. <laughs> Which I think they did. It's either PS2 or the PS3. I was going to say, wait, didn't PS2, wasn't that used to do something nefarious or... I think so. Computing power? Yeah. Like, a military <laughs> did do that. I just, I forget who's. <laughs> it was the greatest land party. Yeah, right. I think it's funny, too, that the military now uses Xbox controllers to pilot their, some of their hardware. It's just cheaper and more easy to use. <laughs> Well, it's probably what most of their soldiers are used to. Yeah, right. R which one is it to launch the missile? It's R1. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's not working. Oh, I remapped it. <laughs> are you Southpaw? How many lives do you get? Back at Allen's, um, he's asleep while Archer's reading over his toy box. And then at this point, he hears a possible Gorgonite distress call in his Terminator vision and apprehensively goes to investigate. Um, the commandos have already gotten inside the house and they capture Archer and this is where Alan overhears them torturing him and he goes downstairs to the kitchen to see what's going on and I love how the commandos are way over dramatic in all of their torture practices so they have Archer strung up over the kitchen sink <laughs> like dangling over the garbage, over the uh, garbage disposal. disposal yeah and they have, like, all of these um, torture tools ready. I think, like, you know, one of them has, like, that Dremel that's used shortly. You know, a knife being ready to cut. <laughs> well, I like how all of them are, like, torturing Archer, like, preparing to torture Archer. But then I'm pretty sure it was, like, Link static because it sounded like Bruce Stern just in the background. Like, oh, come on, man. Just give us information. <laughs> He's, like, the <laughs> only one who's playing, like, good cop to all of it. <laughs> Uh, the commandos flee while some stay behind to fight. The one with the Dremel cuts up Alan's hand pretty good. And it does look like a pretty bad wound too. But Alan frees Archer and then he throws that attacking commando into the garbage disposal where, what did you say his name was? That was um, that was Nick, Nick Nitro. Nitro. He served had, with his father. He was a good man. He doesn't make it. <laughs> he gets uh, pretty badly torn up, but just as... Um, He's escaping through the window. That's when his uh, Alan's parents show up. Person in the kitchen. I think his mom has the baseball bat. And they're just ready to attack whoever is in the house, not realizing it's just the son and the toys. <laughs> and then they attack anyway. Yeah. We've had enough of you, Alan. Which I like how normally a lot of times in these movies, the kids will go on forever trying to hide what's happening in like if they screwed up this it's like the first time his parents catch on to something he immediately just fesses up it's like i made a mistake <laughs> but it's always the they stupid, don't believe him it's the stupid truth that no one believes and they do it later on in the movie too. our favorite movie trope of like call the cops there's a werewolf stalking my mom you need to come and help and they're just like yeah sure okay buddy 
Yeah. So these toys are attacking and they just did all of this. And of course, just when he needs Archer to speak up, that's when the, he plays like Andy's coming and he just goes silent and he doesn't do anything. Yeah. Which like, come on, man. That seemed passive aggressive from Archer. He uses an excuse. And as Alan's in the bathroom with Archer, just trying to clean up his hand wound, it's like, why didn't you say anything? I needed you to speak to prove to my parents that you're alive and you're not just some toy. And Archer replays back the exact line that Arnold, um, that Alan fed to him, like, "Shut up! Don't talk to me." Not. Yeah, a little. A little interesting that they evidently programmed passive aggressiveness into these toys. I like it when my toys are smarmy. I like how the parents, too, were, like, immediately going to hard drugs like, because of yeah. him acting out. She says smack. Was, yeah. <laughs> are you on smack? Like, does this kid look like he has an allowance that could afford hard drugs? You know, back when we had to go through the D.A.R.E. program, they made it seem like there's going to be a guy on every other corner giving me crystal meth and cocaine (laughs) and marijuana and all of these really bad words when it comes to drugs, angel dust. And just, I couldn't think of a single, if I wanted hard drugs right now, I wouldn't know where the fuck to go. On top of that, I know that guy ain't going to give me any of his shit for free. (laughs) That's not how this works. You need a relationship and a credit line. Well, you know a guy. Yeah, just go to any elementary school because clearly, supposedly, they're all just like loitering outside ready to give out hard drugs. The mom is listing off, like, you know, like smack, crystal meth, like cocaine or what i don't know i don't know if it's just heroin but a just the fact that they're saying those names of drugs in the movie i was just like that's a little strange <laughs> and then it just sounds like she's had just watched like a dateline special on teen drug use and was just like <laughs> listing off like is it these is your child acting out it could be because of these are narcotics <laughs> could be smack just a massive disconnect between him and his parents I don't think anyone's on the same page throughout the whole movie. Until like the Except last for, 15 minutes when everybody clicks. The only people on the same page is him and Archer because that's when they realize that the whole time Archer's been in a, in a depressive episode thinking that the rest of his Gorgonite brothers were destroyed by the Commando Elite. But because he was recently tied up and was asked about their location, he now puts two and two together realizing that if the Commandos are looking for the Gorgonites, it means that they're not destroyed after all and they're just in hiding. Um, sorry, did we talk about Frank Frank Langella is Archer? Might have been touched briefly, but I it's yes, funny he is the voice. I know who Frank Langella is, but like I I wouldn't have known that this is his voice. I can't think of his voice or I tried to even watch something with him and I'm like that doesn't sound like Archer at all. I don't know if he changed it or affected it differently, but maybe I just don't know Frank Langella as well as I thought I did. I think normally he has a much more, I wouldn't say commanding voice, but a, a much more distinct voice. I mean, he's no Skeletor, but <laughs> in this, anyway. I just always but, uh... remember him from, like, Ninth Gate um, as, the, well, I don't want to spoil Ninth Gate, but he's in it. Um or all of his Dracula days, for that matter. Yeah, sorry to digress. I was just like, wait, did we talk about Frank Langello? But that's all. The commandos regroup into uh, Alan's garage, and that's where we see Nick Nitro climb in. Um, death is clinging to him as he, uh, with his death sworn to be avenged, the commandos plan out using the supplies found in that garage, and it's just like, chucky's heaven of weaponry because it's just different lawn equipment carpentry house building stuff and just a lot of deadly things that aren't really dangerous but in the wrong hands can be and that's pretty much what the commander will use you can only imagine if they had real munitions yeah like this movie goes the route of like a chucky or um i've mentioned it before but if you've ever seen the movie evolver that I remember always coming on like Sci-Fi Channel or USA back in like the early 2000s, late 90s of the video game 
that uses actually it's very much like this it's a video game that ends up using um i think it's like military chip that goes wrong and it ends up evolving where it adapts and takes like saw blades and all these other things and turns them into weapons on it because it was supposed to be like this laser tag game that progressively increases its own difficulty the more you play as it understands very small soldiers now that i think about it (laughs) hey wait a minute we're protected by legal we said we can do this um i like on nick nitro's death i love chips line nick nitro's battery has run out but his memory will keep going and going and going (laughs) that was that was clever clever wordplay uh we find alan and archer back at his dad's shop and they're trying to find the gorgonites and then archer admits in a straight fight the gorgonites wouldn't win and alan kind of like not in a mean way, but it's like, yeah, because you guys are just, you know, like cowards and you're just quick to fight because you guys think you're trash. And that's when he thinks, hey, let me check the trash. <laughs> and sure enough, that's exactly where he finds them. As long as uh, that's exactly where he finds them, as well as another Gremlins Easter egg. We see a little gizmo keychain in the trash. Kind of harsh um, of Alan to be like, it's because you guys are cowards and you hide. Wait a second. If you're trash, that reminds me. <laughs> I'm just like, tell us how you really feel, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he finds all the Gorgonites inside of the trash can. And um, one of them that was destroyed, Troglacon, was actually rebuilt using the parts from his dad's radio that was in the house or in the in the shop which still surprises me i mean if the commando elite are able to weaponize random tools found in his dad's shop and inside the garage i mean it makes sense that they're able to retrofit a a radio to rebuild one of their fallen comrades but that's still pretty impressive regardless that a toy is able to do this yeah, because, I mean, if that's the case, then, if they're able to use normal parts to rebuild stuff, they shouldn't have gone off into the woods at the end searching for Gorgon. They should have been utilized to be like, hey, so can you use other household electronics to build, like, all sorts of other things? Clearly, your AI is sentient enough to be brilliant designers. It would be kind of funny, yeah, Phil Hartman's like, can you get me a better signal on my television? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. It's just at the end, it should have just been Irwin working in the lab alongside the rest of the Gorgonites on the next line of toys. I'll watch that movie. I love I'm David Cross. made a sequel to this. All of them have like little lab coats on. I saw a couple <laughs> blurbs that were... they I th- Apparently a sequel was tried to get off the ground but just didn't pan out for whatever reasons i wouldn't be surprised if they made like a comic line or something well i guess there was supposed to be i think a remake um that had been discussed as when the works and it was under a different title and then when um was like disney or something that because of the fox merger they canceled like hundreds of projects that were in the works of just like no nope, mm. done end them and that was when it was found out like that one of the movies was a remake of small soldiers either a remake or a sequel something yes so we find all the um gorgonites in the trash and we head over back to global tech uh cross and more walk into the clean room of a production facility to investigate the nature of the chips that were used and here we meet Ralph, being played by Robert Picardo of Star Trek fame. I love Robert Picardo. Yeah, he was the creator, at least the developer, of the X-1000 chips. And he describes on how powerful it could be, including the capability of its AI. You could tell he's a little bitter over its weakness to EMP blasts, which made me laugh. Because, Trope. of course, <laughs> here we discuss at full length what an EMP is and how it's generated... <laughs> And it's pretty much verbatim exactly how it's said in every other movie where an EMP is mentioned. At this point, if they don't mention that an EMP is created from uh, an electromagnetic pulse from a nuclear warhead, it is not an EMP at this point. 
I do the Leonardo DiCaprio gif every time now, ever since our <laughs> Tropes episode when somebody in the movie is like, what we need is an EMP. An EMP? Do you mean electromagnetic pulse? <laughs> <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> uh, oh, I know this one. <laughs> I've seen this one. I like Robert Picardo's like brief rant as he's like pushing Irwin around the room, like advancing on him around the room. And it's, oh, did anybody tell Michelangelo? Sorry, Mike, marble's not cost effective. Here's a bag of cement. <laughs> and he sneezes inside of his... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Somebody else confused by their suits because there's an obvious just like perforation in the face shield. Like that air and things could escape through. I don't know. It seemed like they were, unless that's just, I don't know. <laughs> I think <laughs> it, it stuck was out like, to me. Like, why is there a, a hole in their mask? I almost want to say that it's almost like a callback to the movie Outbreak. Because I think it happened maybe a year or two before this. Or it was probably was made while this was being ma- filmed. And just it, I don't really recall seeing that many like clean suits at that time, and just seeing the obvious break of like the mask broken the way that it is not broken, but it's uh opened and exposed. I did not even catch that. Away. Well, I mean, it's just like just me. there's and a this, seam, felt... there's a seam, there's like an overlap where it's like that's not hermetically sealed or anything. <laughs> it's just... Yeah, and I just felt it was oh, yeah, really it's just like a weird visor. <laughs> Yeah, and I just felt it was really weird that he has that whole, like, tirade. And it's not meant to be funny, but then he sneezes, and then you see that the inside of it is just covered in spit. <laughs> I just felt it was really out of place for the whole movie for that to happen. That's what made me think, like, maybe it's just supposed to be, like, a callback to uh, Outbreak for whatever reason. I mean, I could very well be wrong, and it's just me reaching, but yeah. I, said, I, I thought of it that way. I just relate to sneezing in a mask now, so... <laughs> Walk around with your goo. Being in some kind of helmet that you can't touch your face, and that's the one time your face is the most itchy, or you sneeze and you got crap all over the place. Right. So Alan has all the Gorgonites brought back to his room, and here Kristen Dunst calls him, who he tries asking out on a date. This is where she mentions, uh, like, oh, I only date older guys, which, whatever. As she listens to Rush in the background. Mm. And as I, that, Alan has a Xena Warrior Princess poster on his wall. I appreciated that. So yeah, some light fir- flirting back and forth. And we um, see that one of the commandos is actually spying in on that conversation. He's like wiretapped into the uh, the phone line. And that's where uh, Link Static, I get all their names mixed up. Um, Link Static reports back to Chip. And um, he mentions that they did find an exploitable weakness to gain leverage over Alan in the whole time the other soldiers are making homemade weapons out of the everything that they see inside that shed or uh to queens another one bites the dust Mm -hmm. which i don't know if that's diegetic or non-diegetic if they just like found that album and put it on they do end up using war later on too Yeah, yeah which in terms of kind of all the the gorgonites in alan's room while he's like talking on the phone during all of this originally as a kid i didn't really care about slam fist but watching it now it's like i have a soft spot for slam fist it's just like the very uh oafish soft-spoken kind of character that is a little more endearing yeah it's suiting that they do the quasimodo line later so yeah so like after the the whole link relays the info and they decide they're gonna take over uh well not take over they're going to um, take Christy as bait. I like how Alan's explaining the world outside to the Gorgonites looking out of his window, and it's... Alan, if Gorgon is not in that window, is it in this one? There's nothing in windows. There's stuff outside them. What stuff? You know, outside. Trees. Power pole. Christy's house. And beyond that? The mall. And beyond that? That's the highway. And beyond that? About a million acres of farm. What's beyond town? He's like, I I don't know. And they all look at each other and they hmm, Gorgon. <laughs> I like how his first response to after the, the, the power pole is just, what's beyond that? The mall. <laughs> of course, that's the one thing that the kid would know about the 90s hmm. 
Um, we go back to Phil Hartman's home, and this is where he's showing off his entertainment center in his living room. And this is also where we see the camera crew in the mirror here. Um, Chip and the soldiers enter through the kitchen, and here is where they drug Phil's wife with uh, sleeping pills. They use... Um, they're pretty clever in finding all of these random things to assemble. Like, they use a mouse trap as, like, the pill launcher. Yeah. Like, none of it, like, it's it's a little outlandish, but none of it's completely ridiculous. It's like, no, all of these would probably work. Hmm. So she, as she's sipping away at the gin and tonic, she ends up passing out. And this gives the... I don't know how Phil Hartman passes out, too. He doesn't... He sees seen. her sleeping, so he, like, shrugs, and then he grabs her drink and continues drinking it. Okay, <laughs> I missed that. Yeah, because I, yeah. I was wondering, like, why why did he fall asleep? He wasn't shown drinking it, but I guess... Solidarity. I, yeah, I, I, I guess so, right? Oh, she's <laughs> asleep. I can finally sleep myself. Well, I like how Chip and the gang, they're like, perform Operation Sandman. <laughs> Yeah, that was good. <laughs> also, the one non sequitur when they're like doing their thing, prepping to drug her, and then it just cuts back to Phil Hartman sitting on the couch. He goes, I think World War II is my favorite war. <laughs> yeah. And then it just, just cuts back to them. I wrote that down. She's like, uh huh. <laughs> I think World War II was my favorite war. <laughs> that, that kid gets murdered by the troops here again <laughs> i like how he's like all right and then the major gets shot and then this guy becomes the new leader and the guy's just like i'm sorry sir so yeah it wasn't my idea <laughs> yeah, yeah Kip's like, uh, it wasn't my idea major <laughs> like they sound like they're having such a blast with it it makes all of them so much better i wish they had a little bit more exposure through the movie than just like the quick one-liners yeah like, I wouldn't have mind watching, like, an in-universe TV show with them. Yeah. Actually, like that would have been with, like, perfect. Buzz Lightyear. Yeah. So, um, they climb up the stairs. They dispatch the little brother. They pretty much hogtie him and throw him in a closet. And they go up to Kristen's bedroom. She's out of the house. And here we see her Gwendy doll collection, which is, I guess, similar to Barbie. Uh, the soldiers end up oogling over the dolls, asking for like, sir, can I have some R and R three day pass? I yeah, how, oh, fully posable. I love how Chip Hazard's just like permission denied, <laughs> and he's got plans for these other dolls. Which this is where the suspension of disbelief kind of <laughs> kicks in, because I even thought like this is a bit much. They're yeah. non animate dolls and throwing. They a don't have knockoff. any robotics or circuitry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like how he's like, bring me the head of Nick Nitro. And they're like pulling it apart and taking the face off. And all the guys are like, oh, this is horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to be sick. But yeah, it's a little implausible that they like take the chip and they put the chip into what, like a speaker of some sort. And then connect all these other things and turn into like some sort of Rube Goldberg machine. To turn it into like a factory line. Yeah, that makes like 20 of these dolls. Yeah. But it's fine. It's the only... Uh, I mean, with the world they've set up, it's the only... Re that and Rush. It's the only real world breaking uh, <laughs> thing that, that comes to mind. So, But it's fine. It's forgivable. Well, I like as they're all coming up and then Brick Bazooka, It's alive! <laughs> <laughs> I saw in the fun facts that the music during this scene is from the movie bride of frankenstein mm -hmm. and the Fun. cannon fodder gwendy dolls are uh sarah michelle oh, yeah. geller and christina ricci i i i heard mostly sarah michelle geller i think christina ricci was maybe the first to speak but I like so. sir i unless i'm wrong i just heard more smg but they have a I, I had a hard time voice. differentiating the two i thought i heard yeah. christina ricci but then when you mentioned sarah michelle geller all I heard was Christina Ricci, so I'm not I'm not sure. She's known for you know her deadpan stuff like um, Wednesday, Wednesday and stuff, yeah. but I know she's capable of that bubbly, kind of teenager kind of sounding voice. So I'm not sure who was who. Everybody should watch her on Yellow Jackets right now. Oh, she's in something. Yeah, she's terrific.
Or go watch her in uh, Wes Craven's Cursed. It is Wednesday, my dudes. So Christy comes home to find her parents sleeping and Timmy dead. Wait. Timmy dead. That's a funny shot when she opens the door. It's very Three Ninjas. Yeah. First thing that came across my mind. Okay, first we feast, then we felony. Pizza time. Dead. I like how she tells Brad, like, good night, and he leaves. And then as she's doing all this, he's, like, just pacing outside, trying to think of an excuse on why he needs to come back inside. Creepy as fuck. Go to your freaking ball game practice, Brad. Go to the big game, Brad. <laughs> I guess he didn't win the, or get the final score, seeing as how she dismissed him so easily. <laughs> that works on multiple levels. Badung! Badung? That's not my catchphrase. Badung! <laughs> That's what she said. We cut over to our Alan's room. We see Archer looking out the window. He sees the tree's leaves moving in the wind. And he thinks that it's the Commando Elite in the tree. And this is where Alan explains to him that it's just the wind. It's okay. You're not getting attacked. But funny enough, that's where Kristen next door is getting attacked. Um, she sees that her parents are asleep on the couch. She puts her coat away and doesn't see her tied up brother. And then she goes up to her room and then she sees the factory that's being used to resurrect her dolls who promptly start attacking her. Her boyfriend does hear the screams that she lets out as he's trying to find those reasons to stay. He runs inside to help, but then is attacked by those dolls as well. The commandos arrive, and of course, being the commando elite, they have a makeshift flamethrower that works. And uh, they light his pants on fire, and that causes him to pretty much ditch his pants and run outside the house. They just burn him to a crisp. That's He's when the not... movie takes the hard left turn. Yeah, I think this is the teenage segment that was uh, cut out. Because they had way too much of the ending written to rewrite it. Yeah, so they kept like all those big action pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this is much more like... <laughs> much more child endangerment and uh, violent peril than the rest of the film. Oh, yeah. Because they, they don't, the Commando Elite doesn't pull any punches. So every weapon that they're using may not be like a 50 cal machine gun, but I don't want to go and look at the down the barrel of a, a nail gun either. Yeah. Or, you know, um, saws or any of the other kind of launchers or projectors. I think their most harmless weapon was probably their net launcher. Yeah. And even then, that was like a full scale net launcher to capture a human adult. Well, plus they use the net launcher to then climb on top of them with a knife. And it's like, okay, so it's, it's a net launcher. That's harmless. And then he gets netted and then they climb on top and they were just going to stab him to death. Yeah. No, no thanks. There's a lot of good lines with these Barbie dolls or whatever they're called dolls. Uh, Gwendy dolls. Uh, Gwendy Cannon dolls are Gwendy? tacking everything. <laughs> like... The one's face is like hanging off. She's like, "Well, I'll get facials." <laughs> did I? Uh, did I overpluck my eyebrows? <laughs> Her whole face is missing. It's like a horrifying, like that one Toy Story moment of uh, when they're oh, looking when around they, at all at of Sid's the, house. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, Led Zeppelin's playing. They're playing Communication Breakdown by Led yes. Zeppelin. I notoriously always thought, difficult. Yeah, like I always thought Led Zeppelin was very like tight purse strings in terms of like who gets their music usage and it's like <laughs> they broke it out for small soldiers we heard Tommy Lee Jones was voicing an action figure and we thought this is the perfect opportunity unless they were just like <laughs> man we loved this as Spinal Tap you guys are doing all the voices of the Gorgonites we'll let you use Led Zeppelin <laughs> yeah it was funny that it I wonder there's probably a very short list of movies with Led Zeppelin all I can think of is School of Rock and this. They sold out also to uh, one of the truck companies had a rock and roll. Look at the song, rock and roll. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun little scene. What's your sign, big boy? <laughs> <laughs> Do 
Do you work out? Such broad shoulders. Also, we have to call attention to the fact... Okay. Th they made these dolls alive from their technology. These dolls have programming that is not in line with theirs. So they had to have programmed <laughs> the stereotypical girly thoughts and uh, sayings into them. That's all. I mean, unless it's just like automated machine learning that they're just adapting over time themselves nope. at 400 megahertz of processing power <laughs> you underestimate how much those chips can do i mean we got to the moon using like ti-84 technology <laughs> tinfoil yeah but <laughs> with just a lot of gumption they did all this in, his, in a girl's bedroom with a box of scraps <laughs> Where are my Gwendy dolls? <laughs> yeah, Steve is not a G. He's yeah, he's being assaulted, but he runs away. He doesn't. Oh, his name have... is Steve. Oh no, I don't know. I wrote Steve. Oh, it's I thought probably. It was... Oh, it's Brad. It's Brad. Brad is not a G. What if it they took be... him down and then put the chip in his head? Send out our last guy and all these little figures, and all of a sudden he just comes out with a gun. They're like, wait, what? He looked like one of the kids from Tool Time, Tool Time or uh, Home Improvement. Oh, the oldest one. Yeah. Yeah, it's not him. But yeah, I see that. It does. I see the look. That similarity. If he was one of them, he could have slipped in like as a covert agent and just slit their throats. <laughs> Christy wakes up and they have chips in both of her parents. Timmy, Brad. It's a new world order. <laughs> This movie could have went in a really different direction if they could have put the, those chips in people's heads. Yeah. We should, they should put us on script duty. Like, hey, we've got this property, and then we'll just make a wacky version of it. And, and we get to decide <laughs> the story after that. We wrote this script, but it's not stupid enough. Can you guys do a pass? Oh, I really boy. want to make that Predator movie. <laughs> <laughs> what were the Predators and the Commandos they send down? <laughs> yeah. just to the best and not just like a pest type character no like John Leguizamo reprising his role as the pest <laughs> I have one thing to add I I lied it on the form I'm not the perfect specimen I appear to be I have I have I'm narcoleptic oh oh those things don't grow on trees huh oh Ow! Oh, I'm scared of you! I'll come back when you're feeling a little better! So, give us a call, Fox. At Alan's house, the eye gorgonite Ocula warns Alan about the window, and when he goes to check, an arrow gets fired through the window with a VH ta VHS tape attached to it, and it's just labeled Surrender. And then when he plays the tape, he sees that um, Christy is just tied up and he's she's reading a script. And I, I thought it was funny because she's reading it, you know, and she's scared. But it's the exact kind of talking profile that the commando elite have. Yeah. It's not like they even tried to make it sound <laughs> like she was the one saying all of this. I'm making the statement of my own free will and under no duress. <laughs> yeah, right. Stick to the script. Ow! Read it like we wrote it. Make it snappy. I will be released safely and unharmed only if the following conditions are met. One, surrender the Gorgonite scum. Oh, oh that's it. And that's when they realize that they need to act. Well, also, I like how as the hostage tape is playing, Insaniac is like, what else is on? I didn't like the Gorgonites. I'll be honest. They, uh, he always <laughs> tried to make a joke and I always felt like his kind of fell flat. I mean, Insaniac reminded me of almost like a like Freakazoid. Mm, that could be why I didn't like I, Freakazoid. I feel like he was kind of a missed opportunity because I don't think he really said anything that was like really funny or... He's just constantly not, going. Not to an adult. Yeah, like they could have done a, a Robin Williams kind of thing with him, but I don't, the material they gave him wasn't really that funny. He might have been for the kids, and I think that's maybe why I, I didn't I guess click. so, yeah. You know, for the kids. So, 
<clears throat> he hints at a plan, and then we see Alan carrying out a box to the neighbor's lawn, and it's just labeled as Gorgonites. The soldiers walk out to investigate while Alan sneaks into the backyard. Alan has Archer strapped to a bottle rocket and a parachute attached to Archer. And for a quick second, I thought he was just going to explode to his death. <laughs> but then when the, la- the rocket is launched, um, Archer jumps off the parachute. Um, Archer jumps off the rocket and parachutes down into the chimney. And here is where just Archer um, uses the chimney to get into the house and unlocks the door for Alan to sneak in. Alan also sees uh, Christy's parents asleep still on the couch and head upstairs. I love how everyone walks into the house and they just sees the parents asleep and they just ignore it. There's literally <laughs> World War Three about to happen outside the home and no one bothers to try to wake them. Well, I mean, World War Two is his favorite war. I guess so. Wake um, me when Alan... it's World War Two. <laughs> Back outside, the commandos are seen putting like a firecracker inside the box. They light it, and um, you know they light the fuse and they run away. The whole time, too, you hear the Gorgonites inside, almost pleading with, like, like pleading for help, but it's not really sincere. And you could tell as the viewer something is kind of going on and it's not uh, really them inside, but we don't know. When the explosive does detonate, um, all that's left is once the smoke clears out, you see that it's just another radio and it was playing a tape of, you know, the Gorgonites calling for help. Which and Chip sees this and he knows like, oh, no, like I, we've been swindled. I was trying to listen to hear like if the tape repeats at any point. And they just keep going and going. And I'm wondering, like, <laughs> how long did they record all of them just, like, saying things and pleading over at Alan's house just to make this tape seems they would have to do it in real time? Yeah, right. I remember Alan making the mixtapes. Tapes to go. I remember making mixtapes when I was younger. And it was a pain in the ass because you did have to listen to it at a one-to-one scale. So if it's a five-minute song, you got to wait full five minutes for the song to end before you can you know pause it and play something else or whatever so now back in the day i used to have this like little fisher price cassette player that had like a a microphone on a wire that was attached to it so i would put my tape in i can like play anything or i could record using my little microphone so if there was something i liked on tv i would have to walk over and play it And then hold my microphone up while holding the button the entire duration so I can record like, oh, I really like this song from this movie. Oh, I like like this commercial. And I was just walking around making mixtapes as like a six-year-old. You must have loved the Talkboy when it came out. I didn't actually get one until like well after. I was at like a secondhand store and I saw it. I was like, oh, what? I need to buy this just for nostalgia's sake. Yeah, because I remember using mine. home early. (laughs) <laughs> just throw the commercial in here what'd you do with yours the same thing oh. <laughs> I recorded the um, goofy movie soundtrack using that so I can listen to it in the car my mom bought me the CD which was almost useless because we only had one CD player but we had several cassette players including in the car so the only recording I remember doing as a child was had a microphone for our PC and using the whatever sound recorder app or uh, program, you could record it and then play it in reverse. So I would just fascinated with like downloading South Park clips or whatever, playing it backwards, learning to say it backwards, recording it, saying it backwards, and then reverse it so it sounds like I'm saying it forwards. <laughs> That's uh, just a weird thing I remember doing. I don't know how that somehow tells me nothing and tells me everything at once. A hundred percent agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's the That's most Dean sentence I've ever heard. It's me, ladies and gentlemen. I think it was just more like, hey, look what he can, it's, hey, look, I can say it backwards. It's like that one Dexter's Lab episode. Forward, reverse. When he has the belt that goes like 
reverses time or whatever, and then it gets stuck because he can't say forward and reverse anymore. So he has to like try to say it backwards. That way, it says it forward, so he can. Re- no yeah. idea, poor kid. You just have to set it to Wumbo. <laughs> Alan and Kristen dispatch all the dolls that are in that room who a happy Kristen starts kissing him for and it's a thanks for being rescued and then when they run downstairs the commandos intercept once again they now have real weapons launching firelit projectiles at them and they retreat up and escape through the bedroom but even as they cross the um the lawn the commandos start driving different smaller vehicles with nail guns and other kind of projectile launchers. A chainsaw. Yeah, was right. on one of them. We got like Mad Max vehicles yeah. coming yeah. after them. Alan gets hit by several corn skewers in the leg, but Christy rescues him by uh, getting her moped. That still was just like really like skeeved me out because it's just, I mean, those corn cob skewers are like a good like two inches long and to think that he had four of them in his leg like ouch almost yeah. as bad as getting hit with nails i don't know why nail, i suppose i mean i don't know why seeing in a nail embedded into someone's leg is more is worse than seeing a corn cob skewer and your nail instead i think both are pretty bad oh. it seems like oh well it looks like it looks like a corn cob it's okay it makes everything completely different yeah, one's the novelty a, of it. Yeah, it's like it's the difference between a rated R and a PG-13 rating. is just, I want the kid to have nails coming out of his leg to show that he was shot. Well, you can't do that. Well, what if we did corn cob holders instead? Um, <laughs> we'll allow it. It's family violence. Family stuff. Yeah, right. Those metal discs did some damage, too. They just cut right through those car windows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there, um, his dad later on gets hit in the leg with a nail, but you don't actually see that one. Yeah. <laughs> Still just skis me out thinking like it hits the bone and it gets stuck. Ugh. I do kind of want to see like an R-rated. doesn't have to be super gory, but just where they're actually killing people. <laughs> I mean, Ugh. it would have been such a different, like raise the stakes for the entire back end of the movie is if Brad runs in to help her and they just kill Brad. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, wait. <laughs> wait, so they're willing to do this? <laughs> this Is this a kid's movie? <laughs> they just flamethrower him. It's like the hills have eyes. She just like watches as they burn him. Brad just gets like how, my God. I like how at this point too they're trying to escape on Christie's moped and all the commando elite are following in their own vehicles and then they slowly combine up like Voltron style. <laughs> true. I, I literally have in my notes the commando vehicles combine like Voltron style. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, I was disappointed that they didn't do anything specific because they're now connected to each other. Just yeah. now it's just one larger vehicle instead of like, it would have been cool if one had like the fuel line, another one had like the flame nozzle, another one had the fuel tank. And then another had like another piece to a flamethrower that once they were all together, it just became one massive like flame cannon. Yeah, but all of them being the same height, it's like, okay, congratulations. Most of the vehicles in the back can no longer have a clear shot to fire. All you've yeah. ensured is that you guys do not get separated during this chase. Which doesn't pay off in their favor. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> no, I think it's. I think they wrote it that way to be like, how do we get them to all crash? Yeah, at the same time and explode. They're not even having anything with like explosives in it, but... Well, I mean... There's, there's fuel for flamethrowers, so... I mean, they have bottle rockets, and I keep calling them bottle rockets because there is no missile equivalent in the civilian world. It's it's a bottle rocket. Right. So every time you see him launch a missile at Alan and um, Christy, this thing blows up in a fashion that would be like a mini RPG. Yeah, they're like taking out trees. Yeah, we don't have anything like that. And I don't think he could have made something like that because all he would have had was what, like... He didn't, I don't supplies. think he didn't have time to make pipe bombs and shit. Yeah. Or at least not to make it rated R. But I was writing and I didn't fully see it and I didn't think to rewind. But they get launched over like a small, I don't, I, I, don't, 
I almost want to call it a cliff, but they're 12 inch figures. So a cliff to them is like a large step for us. Well, I remember it was big enough that they went off on like the moped or the Vesper or whatever, and they got like air off it. Because I think it was like an embankment that went up, but then on the other side, it drops like down off from the road. Yeah, it's like it's like a little it's a creek. It's just a little creek bed. Yeah. Yeah. So this, the, you know, the, the kids were able to jump it, but the commando elite weren't. They fall down the cliff creek. <laughs> creek <laughs> and the voltron car falling into the little ravine and just explodes on impact which i just love seeing whenever something just falls to the ground like that and immediately explodes in this big fireball <laughs> yeah um, it's better when it lands and then a second later it explodes yeah <laughs> i was thinking jurassic world when um um the CEO guy is Ronnie flying the helicopter. I was, I was really digging the characters through the whole movie, and he crashes through the aviary in the helicopter. And I'm thinking, like, he's gonna make it. They can't kill him this early. And then the thing just explodes in this massive fireball. I'm like, damn. Well, I guess not. I'm okay. <laughs> just keep the scene going. I'm still okay. Bird pecks his eye out. I'm here it's still. like Will Ferrell and uh, Austin Powers. Oh, poor guy. <laughs> I'm just very badly burned. <laughs> um. So, yeah, so Chip although Alan Christie think the battle is finally over, we see Chip Hazard kind of floating down the rest of the creek, and he's clearly still alive and survived the explosion. And then um, he pulls himself up the embankment, and then as he climbs over, he sees that he's in front of Toy World, who's hosting the launch of the Commando Elite toy line. So putting two and two together, we can see exactly where this is going to go next. Which, it's interesting that we see Joe there at Toy World because they're, I guess, loading all of the toys back onto the truck because he says, like, they're being recalled. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, kind of nice to know that they make that other phone call the, to the company, Irwin and Larry realize like, yeah, the microchip might be a bad thing. And then the company just agrees, like, do a recall on it. Bring it all back in. <laughs> it's not like, no, we need to make money. It's like, nope, this was a bad idea. Right. Bring it back. Right. Exactly right. Get on Mars is fine by me. Betty pays his fair share in taxes. As we all I should. <laughs> <laughs> Come look at my books anytime, IRS. <laughs> After the high speed chase, I was like, "Is this?" I I forgot about like the rest of the movie, I, and I was like, "Is this how it ends? They just explode right there?" It was kind of lackluster. I had to double check because this is called Toy World, and in Jingle All the Way, it's Toy Works, ah. where Arnold realizes that there's more toys. That guy that runs down the street, like they got a late shipment at Toy Works. I thought it was Toy World for a second, thinking that this was the same universe. <laughs> that would have been more fun. links severed. More show, not. like more things should do that. I mean, it's not like it's an IP that oh, you're not allowed to use Toy Works. Yeah, yeah, and don't even ask you. I mean, not for nefarious reasons, but just like slip it in. Like, don't tell the creators. Like, yeah, it's in your same universe. I'm like, yeah. okay, innocent mistake. <laughs> chip can't find a commando unit so he puts the chips into uh all the booster and, yeah <laughs> booster we don't want you booster he has one hell of an army because nobody likes him <laughs> it's, just, it's in the back from last year's christmas sales that no one bought there's ten thousand of these i can get two turbo man but i can get six thousand boosters <laughs> the boosters just like it's a blanket of just moving parts. They just swarm over the top of people, leave a skeleton. 60,000 boosters strong. So poor Joe, um, he was packing up his truck, recalling all of the toys that were dropped off. But just as he starts driving away, uh, Chip intercepts the truck, holding Dick at knife point. Um, really surprised that he was able to realize... That all the toys were now in the truck. Yeah. Unless then again, we don't know how long he was watching. 
That's true. But the poor guy. So yeah, he holds Joe at knife point, wanting to basically commandeer the whole truck. And in here, we cut back to Alan and Christy getting back to their home. But all the parents are now awake at this point and want to know what the hell is going on with their kids' recent behavior and not believing, of course, anything about the toys. Just as Phil has heard enough, he goes to leave, but that's when um, Jay Moore and David Cross are show up at the doorstep about to knock. One of those, like, he's about to knock, and the door opens, and, you know, his hand is up. <laughs> um, hits him right in the face. <laughs> they never do that. And in here, the commandos... Yeah, that was a cut... satisfying punch. Yeah, why? Right. The commandos cut the power to the Abernathy house, and then... When Alan and family look outside, they realize all the commando elites from the store are now rallying outside their home. So, question. With all of the toys that Chip was able to liberate from that toy store, where are the other Chip hazards? Because it seems like there's only <laughs> one made, but there's he's like an 15 narcissistic. <laughs> Nick Nitros and 10 Brick Bazookas. What we didn't see is the scene of him opening the packaging for all the other chips and slitting their throats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there can only be one. <laughs> yeah, I think it's... I looked at it as a narcissistic thing. I mean, or for that matter, how many other Gorgonites did they have in that shipment? Yeah, you would think, right? Like, they just... Before the coming back to the, the house, Holy they just hell. destroyed every We have to other... kill all these. <laughs> Damn, I didn't think about that one. Yeah, they probably put... killed a ton of archers and insaniacs and <laughs> slam fists. Don't put these questions in my head. So Phil Hartman's just had enough, um, insisting he doesn't want anything to do with this game before the Gorgonites, between the Gorgonites and the Commandos. He runs yeah, outside. they fully buy it at that point. They're like, yeah. Well, it's outside. easy. Just give up the Gorgonites and we're out of this bullshit. Right? Yeah. Because my least favorite, th of all the movie, my least favorite thing, I think, is the fact that before they find out about the action figure thing and all the toys are alive, like, Phil is there accusing Alan of drugging him and his wife and brainwashing his daughter. And they're like, we're going to have to bring you to deprogramming um, to, like, they use it for cults kind of deal. And it's like, come on, guys, you literally have Slam Fest talking to you when Larry and <laughs> yeah. Irwin arrived. Right. Wow. Uh, yeah, so he runs outside, realizing that his, they stole his stereo system to put it outside. And then the humans shack up inside the house as the commandos line up in front of the house, providing psychological warfare by blasting Spice Girls while firing nail guns through the window. <laughs> hey, Marion yeah, loves that song. This launches pretty much like a 10-minute long assault on the, uh, the house. <laughs> yeah. It's like assault on precinct It's a 13. long... It's a long sequence. There's a lot that goes on here. Yeah, it is. I was like, I'm like Nick. I was thinking, I think Nick's gonna be able to like navigate this like a story. <laughs> Just like play uh, the pretty, highlights. Yeah, I, pretty much. <laughs> so like, Alan's mom has a segment of her using her tennis skills to deflect the flaming tennis balls back at the commandos. I thought that was kind of funny. Nice forehand, honey. She she took command through the entire thing which i greatly appreciate it's not always just like oh it's the men's job to do this the women have to hide she knows like the other mom isn't going to be useful so like you your son go in the closet she gets her <laughs> tennis racket she's ready i really like that she took well, lead. Yeah, yeah she was like she tells um like men barricade the front alan put out fires nerds side windows <laughs> and larry and her go. <laughs> but yeah she Jay starts Moore like serving like, balls me. back and um I think it was Stuart. He's like, we have to stop him before my wife gets tennis elbow. <laughs> <laughs> Which then brings us back to the grand idea of we need an EMP. So every trope is not complete without this final piece of the conversation. David Cross explains that they just need that EMP to disable the toys. And here's where we discuss more about the EMPs and how to find them. And Phil knows just, I like how his name is Phil in this movie too. Yeah. So uh, Phil knows just where they need, uh, knows that they just need a big one to uh, dispatch everyone. And Alan's mother dispatches the flaming tennis ball launcher while the nerds uh, decide that the transfer on the power pole, out, uh, the transformer on the power pole outside could be their key to winning. Their plan Which... is kind of stupid in my eyes because it's, he could have died. And I really feel through that whole segment, there should have been a massive disclaimer at the bottom, like, do not try this at home. 
No, they should have just had him die at the eight. Or like <laughs> when, uh, what's his name? Tim gets shocked in Jurassic Park. He sets it off and gets launched. And then they're like doing uh, CPR on him. You know, because in the book, they do explain like, it takes a long time for power to build up across that long, massive fence. Because it's not like a, like a two foot um, fence where it's pretty quick to power the entire thing. It takes a long time for all that electricity to go across the entire island. So it makes sense on how it doesn't kill him, but it does give him one hell of a shock. One Alan should have been dead on shock. the fucking spot <laughs> when he put that toy on there. Little fucking latex rubber glove ain't gonna cut it. A skeleton wearing a hoodie lands on the ground next to Christy. <laughs> but yeah, that, that rubber glove, like that that made me laugh seeing that that's the protection that he had but i like how uh erwin says like they need the emp and they're like but we're not going to be able to get one large enough and whatnot and then phil's like well any electronic device can give off an emp <laughs> it just won't be large enough it's like <laughs> phil how do you know this why do you know this <laughs> probably it's um, military that's how we got all that equipment <laughs> i like that everybody in the neighborhood just assumes that the noise is they're like fimple <laughs> they're all like it's bill hartman like several enough neighbors enough are like, we kill him tonight shit off. <laughs> all also, the neighbors Tim, start marching out after him <laughs> they join the they join <laughs> the commandos um i don't know if you noticed tim but christy failed the call the police with the hard to believe situation test yeah which then she tries to like <laughs> She tried to save it, but it was yeah. too late. Yeah. There's a prank hand. Everywhere. Yeah, and then she's like, oh, wait. Uh, I mean, it's a prank. Send the police. You're sending them now, right? Ah, she was so close. She should have led with something more believable. Yeah. In distress, she should have just ordered a pizza. <laughs> she just said, Stuart Abernathy's killing my father. And they're going to be like, you huh, finally snapped. <laughs> Damn kid. <laughs> Stab him once for us. Get him. Yeah. He's just doing a bunch of graffiti. I think he's trying to call you now to place a bomb threat. <laughs> they look out their wall. They just see like all posters of just Alan. Alan. Start putting vests on, grabbing their shotguns. Whenever you say Alan, I can't help but think of a fucking raptor on an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you've noticed it that like twice throughout the episode, I just said, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. Nick's going to go like, back and replace every instance of us just saying Alan throughout the episode with that clip of the Raptor saying Alan. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I like the nod to uh, uh, Apocalypse Now with the helicopter. Oh, coming. to like Ride of the Valkyrie. Chip, yeah, Chip's helicopter flying around the house. I like how he flies. He's like, I love the, the smell of something in the morning. Oh, which polyurethane. From the, the polyurethane. Yeah, I love the smell of yeah. polyurethane in the morning. He's like, this one's for Nick Nitro. <laughs> which is interesting that despite the fact that Chip is aware that he found all these other like identical copies of these guys, clearly he's still tied to his original unit. Yeah. Because like, why does he care? There's thousand other Nick Nitros in his unit right, right now. It's like, no, but that was his units nick nitro just also not smart enough to contemplate their own existence so are they alive <laughs> they just get existential and they just kill themselves out there on like the he lawn. sees hundreds of other of his unit he's like yeah this is great <laughs> he doesn't question it <laughs> works for me what do we do with all these other chips what other chips <laughs> walks away fire in the background <laughs> what did you do <laughs> so i like how during this assault um stewart takes out one of their machines with like a broom and he blows it up and then they start fire like they bring out a nail gun and they start attacking and they're like hey kid don't you like nine inch nails <laughs> i didn't hear that joke i didn't either i think at this point a lot of their jokes kind of went in and out Real quick there, I for mean, me. I feel like there they, was a lot of just thrown away one-liners in the background as they were doing this. Oh yeah, especially with the Gwendy dolls alone, they had quite a bit of uh, one-liners. They were just shooting them out <laughs> as fast as that nail gun could fire and seeing what could stick. All my makeup is cruelty-free. <laughs> yeah. 
fucking terrible. <laughs> so this is when the commandos nail Stuart. Uh, yes, it yeah, is. In the uh, leg. Alan tries. Uh, Alan gets his father to cover him as he tries to go for the power pole, and Archer convinces the Gorgonites that it's no longer time to hide, and they actually start to fight back. And despite always wanting to hide, their combat skill is pretty fucking good, if you ask me. Like, I think they're much better. Like, in a one to one, they're like, we can't win against a one on one. I, whatever Al, um, Archer said, you know, one on one, we can't win against the Commando Elite. But they, I think they did a better job than the Commando Elite. Like they need all those makeshift weaponry to yeah. keep up with them. Because I mean, like Insaniac just jumps out there with like his little mace and just spins like a Tasmanian devil and is taking out groups of them. And Slam Fist literally has a boulder for a fist. I mean, it, it proof is right there. Tim, well, then I... Freakenstein, like, jumps out, takes over one of their machines, and then turns it on him, and he's just, like, taking all of them down. So it's like, you guys are, what, five, maybe six figures, and you're fighting off hundreds? That usually goes with the good guys. They don't so, give enough, themselves punches. enough credit. So if they just rallied earlier in the movie when there were only, <laughs> like, six commandos, they Instead easily could have overpowered them. They needed oh, yeah. this character change, though. They needed it to happen. Um, did you hear the bowling ball, the bowling strike noise? When oh, yeah. It runs down. Yeah, I gotta have it. When you knock a group of the guys down, it's gotta be a bowling ball strike. Like that one scene in Mortal Kombat. <laughs> Isn't this where the second Wilhelm scream is? It's after the EMP. Uh, Should have been so when Alan, I think gets shot with a nail. Yeah, so Alan does show some concern for Archer, knowing that he's going to fry too once the uh, the transform is destroyed. But Archer knows what must be done. He's just like, go, Alan. Christy tries to get the cops to show up, and of course her favorite movie trope of telling the cops the truth doesn't work in her favor. So instead she tells them that it's just a prank hand, and they should come to investigate anyway. <laughs> and then uh, lots of quick cuts going between the characters. Um... As Alan climbs up the power pole, you know, it says he's about to um, wedge that wrench in to connect the two transformers. Um, Chip uses that homemade helicopter to get up to him. And attacking Alan, the kid starts dangling from the power pole while Archer grapples his way up there to face off with Chip Hazard. It was really cool that he used the thing like a grapnel, like Batman style. Also, also, I like how Chip is like actually just knifing Alan's hand while he's trying to hold on up there. <laughs> yeah. Before Archer shows up to help. He's brutal. Yeah. <laughs> like, who will survive and what will be left of them? Small like, it skews soldiers. me out. Like, obviously, we don't want to get cut <laughs> by a knife, but just getting the thought of like a small, less than one inch long knife that's still razor sharp cutting into us is just as bad, if not worse. Yeah. No thanks. So the two face off against each other and Chip wins and kicks Archer off that power pole. But this gives Alan the time to grab Chip, climb back up enough onto the pole to kind of brace himself anyway, and uses Chip to bridge the gap between the two Transformers. And that's when the power pole starts to surge with power. Uh, Christy literally is on a lawnmower and is mowing down the opposition to get Alan out from harm's way. And then over where uh, David Cross and Jay Moore, they're at that house trying to overload the fuse box. And then when they finally do, the transformer explodes and we see the shockwave of the EMP go across the whole neighborhood. And all of the commandos are seen getting fried. And this is where we see the second Wilhelm scream. Dean's favorite. Ah! Kind of anticlimactic that after all this, Archer is like, we have to fight them. We're not cowards. And he goes up there and then he just gets throttled by Chip. Yeah, and he, tossed back he doesn't off. do anything to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I was wrong. Gorgonites, run. <laughs> it would have been cool if he's the one that like kicked Chip into the... And, yeah, like, like even if he gap. kicks Chip, like a double drop kick and launches himself off, but launches Chip off. Even if it launched Chip over, that he yeah. fell next to him, so we can grab yes. him. Yeah, whatever he did that killed, quote unquote, kills himself, kills Chip. Yeah, it's too bad. Instead, he gets this as Sparta off the pole and 
down to the ground. But I guess it works out. Um, the morning we cut to the morning after, and there's a cleanup crew with you know um, fire and ambulance people there to help. Uh, Dennis Leary arrives by helicopter once more, and he sees all the destruction. I do love how he bribes everyone who tries to talk to him <laughs> with a, just with just a check. You know, like one guy goes up, like I, you know, you need to move the truck, and <laughs> Joe's like, you know, I, I, you know, I got a lot of damages, I, I, I got neck pain, and just I don't think this is gonna work. And you just you see the assistant write on the, the checkbook and hand him that, and he's like, right away, sir, we'll do it right now. <laughs> Well, just like a handy like printing machine, it just prints checks. Like, I like yeah, right? Phil Hartman, who he's like stopping mid complaint because he's talking about like all the damage to my house, and then his tone immediately shifts like mid rant of they hand him the check and he just this is good thanks and just yeah. walks away. <laughs> uh, Even yeah. Alan's father too, who's really insistent, and you're thinking like, oh, there's no way that he's going to be bought off with money. And I don't think like, even you have enough money to. Oh, I guess you do. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a funny little bit at the end. Yeah, I, I really like that. That's where I have the. Uh, he's like, uh, how much do these cost? He's like, eighty bucks or seventy bucks. He's like, add a couple zeros to that and sell them to rebels in South America. <laughs> well, and then he gets like, on the helicopter and he's like, "Too bad, this would have made a hell of a commercial." Yeah. Like, I know they talk about how Jingle All the Way seems like the movie was entirely made to sell figures, which, like, I guess at the end of the day it wasn't, since the figures came out too late. This, I feel like the entire thing, intentionally, unintentionally, is the perfect commercial for these figures, while also being yeah. self-aware enough to make fun of the fact that they're selling these. Right. Mm -hmm. I might have been too old for the toys that had come out, but I'm pretty sure I was still young enough that I would have wanted to see these toys or at least have one of them. Yeah. And I may not need the whole toy line, but at least to have Chip or Archer would have definitely been up my alley. Yeah, I we really don't remember having any of the toys. I remember the Burger King line that came out, but when it came to just the normal toy sales, I honestly don't recall them. We were like 11, so we're kind of above action figure age around mm -hmm. that time. I was nine, and uh, I loved them. So, I mean, the, despite, yeah, I think despite my age, I might not have been buying them, but I still loved going into Toys R Us and looking through the aisles to see what was even available. I rarely went to Toys I wish I went to Toys R Us more often as a kid. I was never taken there. I, I loved it. But I don't remember ever seeing Small Soldiers toys. Probably give it a Google search after this. Yeah, I definitely had never seen them before. Uh, I don't know. Like, I just didn't know they existed. It makes sense. I mean, of course. But when I saw that guy a couple of months ago, a year ago, make those customs that look like they came from the movie, I was like, holy shit. Right. Probably a market for these. And then it makes me laugh when, on the flip side, Jingle All the Way a movie about a toy and they never make it <laughs> like yes they eventually yeah, till later do. yeah as a collector thing yeah yeah they made two instances of turbo man and both times were just directed to a small audience but for when the movie came out if they released a tie-in toy to that movie you know the full line of you know the villain booster and the demon team pretty sure it would have sold booster i would have bought it i would have bought it I'd have only got Booster, an army of Boosters. Alan searches through the debris looking for the Gorgonites. He eventually finds them under uh, Phil's satellite dish from the beginning of the movie. Who um, He's not sure if they survived that EMP blast. So as he picks them up, he tries talking to them, and Archer is really like electronic voice box speaking, and he starts reciting the same, like, Halt, who goes there? Halt, who goes there? Greetings, I am Archer, emissary of the Gorgonites. Greetings, I am Archer, emissary of the Gorgonites. Oh, man. Greetings, I am Archer. Your chip got fried, just like the, the commander. Alan thinks that, oh no, they did get fried, and then he's like, wait, the Gorg uh, the the commando elite are dead, and then just Archer looks down to the rest of his crew like, guys, we won, and that's when we see that they did survive because of the satellite dish. So how was that to them? They survived the battle. 
I know it's like a dramatic reveal, but like, why would they remain dormant when it's like, oh, it's our friend is here? <laughs> yeah, like, were they and, messing with him? Are they playing dead the whole time? <laughs> they have a knack of going silent when they shouldn't. I guess so. They are cowards. <laughs> So then we finally get to the final scene of the movie. Alan had brought them to the local national park along with the wooden boat that his dad had in the shop. And he has the boat in the water with all the Gorgonites lined up inside it. And we see them sail off down the river, happy to be free of the commando elite who now used to hunt them. They say their goodbyes and that's it. Roll credits. I... Like, I thought they were on a lake, and I was going to be like, how how <laughs> far exactly are you guys going to go? My like, thoughts were like... They go across to the other side, and he's still just watching them, and it's only like 70 feet. My thought is like, there's no rudder on that boat. There's no way to control that boat. They're just going to get caught on the riverbank uh, 100 yards down, and like, <laughs> like no, we found Gorgon. <laughs> I'm sure his dad fixed it, but that sail is barely hanging on there. I would have tried to reason with them, like, guys, listen, you're toys. <laughs> there is no Gorgon, but my house is pretty cool. Just, like, live with me and, like, be my cool little friends. Because, I mean, the whole thing of, like, we have to find Gorgon. Okay, and do what? Even if they <laughs> yeah, decide this forest is Gorgon, it's like, you, what, you gotta build a little house? Like, granted, now you what? don't have to eat food. Your battery lasts forever, but, like, the elements. I don't know if they're waterproof. <laughs> Yeah. We get some existential crisis going on. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. That is small that's soldiers. It. And then we get end credits to a cover of war. By oh, was it a cover of war? It I was just a turned cover it off of, right as it I mean, to roll. I guess it like sampled war or whatever, but it <laughs> it's war by Bone Thugs and Harmony. Flesh and Bone, Henry Rollins, Tom Morello, and Flea. That is the 90s lineup you could have this ever was like, described. This was like the Spawn soundtrack or all of these like 90s soundtracks of we need to take like a hip-hop artist and a metal or a rock artist and combine them together and have all of them do like juxtaposing sounds on these. We've constructed a supergroup. Super group Born indeed. of small soldiers. I wouldn't have imagined Tom Morello to do that. Yeah. Probably on that global... Uh, I hear it in his, I hear it in the guitar. Yeah. Probably part of that Globotech payroll. Anyone will see this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this will do. Yes, thank you. <laughs> That'll be great. I, Thanks. <laughs> I enjoyed this movie. It's still good. So entertaining. I, All the little funny, a great, lots of little lines and stuff tucked into the movie. Yeah, I appreciate I it more by, as, uh, as an adult. I actually like the Commando Elite better than the Gorgonites a little, only because I felt they're more rare. entertaining. Yeah, they had more references and adult appreciation versus the uh, Gorgonites did. Yeah. yeah. Like if they had an entire, like a little, I don't know, like a six episode little series, same as now they're owned by Disney. On like Disney Plus, I would watch just them, just the commandos doing commando things. Yeah, I, I really feel the Gorgonites would have um, prospered from having a, a Buzz Lightyear or Star Command type show based on them. Yeah. Instead of uh, what we got in the movie, they were just so shoehorned in to quick scenes that the commando elite had time to flesh out almost every individual unit member. Whereas the Gorgonites just didn't have that time and they were always lumped in together. I so, feel like the non-talking one had the most exposure. Oh, um... The eyeballs. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was going to say the others were, I think, s scratch it and punch it or something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like, the rest of the Gorgonites don't even come in, I feel like, until, what, a third to a halfway into the movie? Mm -hmm. And even then, they only have, like, two or three scenes just disappointing yeah well we had to have more time to set up that romance between alan and christy even though shared trauma does not a relationship make we'll be broken up within like a month tops that was inappropriate that prolonged makeout scene they had at the end of the movie <laughs> archer's like 
Alan, please send our boat away. <laughs> Not yet. Hold Alan, on, please. Man. Let us go. <laughs> they all get out. They start pushing the boat themselves. Insaniac just one of them really dies. Drowns. jokes the whole time. Well, Insaniac, <laughs> they showed spinning that fast before in a circle with his arms out when he was fighting the other guys. They should have just held his legs off the back of the boat and had him do that and just <laughs> use him like a propeller. That would definitely work. That okay, solves the so problem. Okay, so long, Alan. <laughs> they just take off. <laughs> Just cut to them going over a waterfall. <laughs> just his cheeks blowing back as he's standing up there on the mast. Also, unless do the Appalachian Mountains go near Ohio? <laughs> Wait, yes. what? Why? <laughs> this what? takes place in like an Ohio town. It does it. I thought it was California. No, it's Ohio. There's several references to Ohio brands and stuff. Well, like the mall. Um, and there's a isn't that a there's like a huge mountain at the end of that of that shot, isn't there? Like the river they're going down, that pans up or tilts up, and it's like a mountain. <laughs> like, is there mountains over there? I mean, if they were supposedly in Ohio, I wonder if that was supposed to be like Lake Erie. So apparently, the touchy feely, the inner child of Winslow Corners, Ohio, doesn't have wait what? Where does Small Soldiers take place? <laughs> because Mars is a bottom lining jerk. The toys are rushed into production and some of them fall into the hands of suburban teen Alan Abernathy, who thinks his dad's toy store, the touchy-feely The Inner Child of Winslow Corners, Ohio, doesn't have enough pizzazz. So he's from Winslow Corners, Ohio. Which I assume I think is it's not like a real a false. Place. Yeah, it's like a false Ohio town. Yeah. There is a Winslow Township, but that is in Camden County, New Jersey. So no. Wait, they had snow-capped mountains in that scene? I don't think it was snow-capped. I just think... Let me double-check it here. I mean, our Appalachian Mountains aren't really mountains. Appalachian. Yeah, they go down river, it pans up, tilts up. That is a legit mountain. It's like a mountain. (laughs) So I don't know what area of Ohio that is. Maybe there's a mountain over there. I mean, Pencil, does... the, the Appalachian goes through Pennsylvania, so it's it it might be just that. I don't know why I'm reading so much into this. I just knew that it was Ohio, and I was like, why is there a mountain there? <laughs> if you're from Ohio, write and tell me about all the mountainous uh, river river views that you have there. If you're from Ohio, but you're filmed in Orange, California, let us know where. <laughs> Even the trees, those definitely look like it was Ooh, filmed in California. Eight epic hills and mountains in Ohio. Maybe maybe there is something there. Yeah, they're just hills. <laughs> I feel like this episode's really going out with a whimper than a bang. <laughs> it's the, it devolves into 20 minutes of geographic reference on Google image searches for uh, what wooded area of Ohio. So in the other closing thoughts to this commando-driven exposure of Gorgon I, mistreated I loved the movie and I was going to do a fantasy kick after Willow but I'm almost considering doing Evolver next with uh, William H. Macy and Ethan Embry I'll just watch because anything was, you want it reminds me of technology games going crazy kind of deal like this one um, but it was in I think 1994 so it actually predates this. Tim, do do what you want. Don't change based on us. We'll see. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I remember watching it in theaters and just the whole toy aspect of, you know, being a toy enthusiast as a kid. This really hit home, just like Jingle All the Way. Um, watching Jingle All the Way reminded me of this a lot and it felt like, you know, I think this would be fitting to do next. So... And plus, I liked Phil Hartman in it, and pretty good overall. I do appreciate it more as an adult than as a kid. I just like the whole concept of toys coming alive, that kind of thing. Whereas as an adult, just funny to see the Commander Elite kind of bumble their way through everything and being so fucking crazy when it comes to their weapon crafting. (laughs) I didn't realize how extreme it was until being an adult and seeing 
everything that they were able to do. I agree. And there you have it. So that wraps up another episode of Screen Refresh. If anyone wants to give us a shout out with their nostalgic memories of toys past or any other reason, let us know over at Screen Refresh on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, or you can email us over at screenrefresh at gmail.com. So Dean and Tim, this is Nick signing off. I think World War II was my favorite war. Uh-huh.